Space Travelers, welcome home. You've just tuned your dial to Space Dial Radio, the only place where you can own the night. I am your host, Mr. Rob G, and tonight we're broadcasting to you on our terrestrial affiliates across North America and digitally on TalkStream Live, KPNL, and Odyssey Radio. Remember, you can access our archives for free at youtube.com forward slash Space Dial Radio, and while you're there, please consider hitting that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where the options are endless. You can stay up to date with the SOR Newswire, get some official Spaced Out swag, plus rock out to some Bumblefoot, and oh, 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 so much more. Welcome, everyone, back to After Hours. Back again, just seems like yesterday we were here. Now we're back, and we're going to go ahead and get in some really good stuff this uh, weekend. Tonight's guest is just Jeff Selver who is an experiencer, author, uh, has a bunch of great stories uh, to jump into, I'm sure. We'll hear some of that tonight. Um, Just another great night, right? Uh, Glad to be here with you guys as well. I mean, it's, uh, like I said, the week goes so fast, and then all of a sudden we're here again. So totally glad to be here with you guys. Definitely want to jump in and see uh, what our medal positions are tonight. Who has stepped in the building tonight? Let me go ahead and take a look. In the chat here. All right. So it looks like from what I can see here. First one in the chat tonight. Uh, from what I can see here is Abbott Hoffman. Saying Jeff Selvers experiencers are amazing. So Abbott Hoffman looks like you have the gold tonight. Uh, we got race fan saying good evening Rob with the silver. Thanks for coming in race fan. And then we have Major Lee, Lee the B. Welcome to the show uh, with the bronze saying greetings. Greetings right back to you, Major Lee. Thanks for coming on in tonight. We do appreciate you guys showing up here at the After Hours where we get it in every single weekend. So let's see who else has joined us tonight. We have JSC077. Do appreciate you coming on in tonight. We have... Jim, Bim Jim, uh, the Russians and U.S. military have done repeatable experiments to say consciousness is a spectrum. There is a consciousness spectrum. I can buy that and believe that. It makes sense. I mean, you go all the way back to the uh, the Stargate, Project Stargate, and uh, all, you know, they, they I definitely feel like the governments of the world uh, have a really good idea that we have something locked in within us, and uh, which is why they would have even attempted experiments like those, things that most people would think are really strange and weird, uh, but, but it's because they know that we have something that we can unlock within all of us, and uh, they were ahead of the curve on that. 
So thanks for the information, uh, Bim Jim. We do appreciate you. And I agree with this as well. And I say this all the time. The indigenous knowledge keepers know more about consciousness. That's a fact. You want to go back and you want to get the real story. You got to go back and talk to the natives. The stories have been told for millennia. Uh, and, and, and they all depict things that we're trying to figure out here in, you know, right here and right now in today's age. So do agree indigenous knowledge keepers know more about consciousness and, and probably just more about uh, life itself. The, you know, re the real reasons why we're here. So hopefully that's some stuff we could jump into at some point. But appreciate you for coming on in, Jim. Uh, who else do we have in here? We have... Cosmic Joe Chronicle saying, "Hey Rob G, how's it going this evening? I'm doing, I'm doing a lot better. Cosmic Joe, I, I feel like I'm at about 90, 90, we'll call it ninety five percent right now. Uh, feeling really good. Last week I was a little cloudy, um, but yeah, we're ready to get it in. We're ready to get it in. So appreciate you coming in, Cosmic Joe Chronicles. Uh, who else do we have in here? We do have Gizmo saying hello, Mr. Rob G and friends." It shall be an interesting interview. I really hope so. Uh, definitely um, interested in hearing uh, what Jeff has to say here tonight. And uh, we'll be bringing him in after we do our re weekly review, as you guys already know. Uh, so I do appreciate you coming on in, Gizmo. Uh, thanks for showing up. We got Ginger Turtle 43 Happy weekend, Rob, and everyone else. Uh, definitely Ginger Turtle 43 Happy weekend to you as well, wherever you may be joining us from on this planet we call Earth. Uh, do appreciate you showing up here tonight. Who else do we have? Looks like we have Tamoth Man. Tamoth Man has showed up tonight. We do appreciate you, Tamoth Man. Thanks for coming in, saying what up, what up, right back to you. Uh, who else do we have here? Welcome to the show, Lee the B. So, Lee the B, did you change up? Or are you uh, rocking two accounts tonight? Uh, hello, SOR. Thanks for coming on in, uh, Lee. And let's see, who else do we have? Aloha, Dave13. Buenas noches a todo de Mexico. Uh, good evening, everyone from Mexico, right? Appreciate you coming on in. And uh, keeping us bilingual, right? It's, uh, it's very important. We know that, that Spanish is is technically the first language here in the United States. So uh, keeping us bilingual with, with the Spanish and the English, man, do appreciate you uh, coming in tonight. Who else do we have here? Brandon Coast saying, hell yeah. With the middle finger emoji. That's what I'm talking about. Let's go. Let's go. You pumped up tonight? I'm pumped up. Let's get it in tonight. Let's keep this thing moving. Let's do what we do, just like we do every single weekend. Thank you for coming on in, Brandon Coast. We appreciate you. We got Little Cam 5 1. Wow. 150 plus dead in Moscow. Terrorist attack. Russia's 9 11 yesterday. I did not know about that. I'm going to have to look into that Little Cam 5 1. Prayers goes out, though. Prayers goes out. Any human being out there, man, it's all about humanity. I don't care what country you're from. I don't really get into all that, right? We're all human beings, and uh, to lose any human being is a tragic thing. So, uh, shouts out to um, anyone who lost someone in that attack. Uh, who else do we have tonight? And thank you for coming in, Lil Count 5 1, and thanks for the information. Uh, we have Gizmo saying to Mothman, can you keep a secret? Hmm. I don't know. I don't know. Thanks for coming in, Gizmo. Appreciate you. We got Robert Lamoth Jr. saying, hello, guys. Hello, Robert Lamoth Jr. Thank you for coming on in tonight. We do appreciate you. Uh, let's see. Who else do we got in here tonight? Uh, Brandon Coe says, also, awesome guest. Okay, with the horns. Okay, I love it. I love it. Uh, let's see. Warning Dragon saying hi digs. So if you're referring to the social dig, so shouts shouts out to you, uh Warden Dragon, for giving it up tonight. We do appreciate you coming on in the after hours. Trying to debate on uh if we're doing after show tonight, social dig. I've uh, been feeling better, so maybe we'll just end up doing that tonight. 
Uh, it'll be a game time decision, but we do appreciate you coming on in, Warden Dragon. Uh, who else do we have in here? We have Christine Lynn saying hi all. Hello, Christine Lynn. Thank you very much for coming on in. Uh, who else do we have? Paul Holland saying hello. Hi, Rob. Hi, Paul. Right back to you. Thanks for coming in. We do have Audacious Amber saying a hey, a hey, right back to you, Audacious Amber. Thank you for coming on in tonight. We appreciate you showing up here to the after hours as we get it in again, right? Get it in again this evening. It's going to be an awesome weekend. I can def I can guarantee you that. Um, who else do we have here? We have Facebook user stop through talking about hello SOR family. Welcome, welcome, Facebook user. We do appreciate you coming on in. Cannot get the party started without you showing up. So thanks for getting here uh, on time. And yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do it. So who else do we have? We have Stone Hobbit with the ghost emoji, alien head emoji, and the kissy kissy emoji. Appreciate you coming on in, Stone Hobbit. Thanks for checking in. Um <laughs> Uh, look, Brandon Coe, what's up? We're reading your chalkboard, Rob G. It's a story behind this here. I keep it up here. Um, my daughter used to sleep in this room, and we put up, or she put up a chalkboard wall, right? And from here all the way over here is just a lot of things that she had on her mind. And I'm really about, you know, being a free mind and having a free uh, uh, opinion on things of the world. And so I decided to leave it all up here as my backdrop so if anyone else is wondering along brandon coast what all this is about and stuff you can't see off screen here uh this these are the thoughts of of uh i don't even what they're not millennials i don't know what they are whatever the newest generation is these are the thoughts that they have and i thought it was pretty uh i thought it would, would be a pretty awesome thing to keep that up there so thanks for that and who else do we have here we have silent listen saying always here just silently listening and we love that we we, we really love participation in the chat too so whenever you do what you've done right here and drop the line at least let us know you're here and say hey uh that's all we need so you can go ahead kick back and, and listen silently for the rest of the show if you wish we just appreciate you showing up and uh dropping the line for us tonight so thanks for coming in uh who else do we have we got Puck Elf up in the building, hugs and high fives all uh, going to lay back down and listen from bed. Okay, that, that, right. Okay, that's all good. Thanks for coming in, Puck Elf. We do appreciate you showing up tonight. Oh, okay. Thanks for clearing this up. Welcome to the show. Lee the Bee is not my account. He, she is another member of the SOR family. Okay. Okay, there's room for more than one Lee here. Okay, I got it, got it. Thanks for clearing that up, because it didn't make sense. I was like, I know it's Lee, Lee. Okay, well, both Lees, thank you for coming on in tonight. We do appreciate you uh, showing up and coming in to support Spaced Out Radio. Uh, who else do we have? Stargazer saying, sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride on the Wu train. It's almost kind of like what I say on the social dig, like kick your feet up, get an ice cold beverage and get ready to join the conversation. And that's kind of what uh, still applies right here at After Hours. So do do appreciate you dropping a line for us here, Stargazer. Thanks for coming in. Uh, Doug Shelby has stepped in the building saying, what up, Captain Rob G and all you fellow SOR heads. What's going on, Doug Shelby? Thanks for coming on in. Thanks for showing up tonight. Uh, who else do we have? Okay, we got a Bob Marley sighting. Bob Marley has stepped in the building saying in Ireland they call people from Wexford Wexicans. Now I don't I don't know what that means, but um you know I'm not even familiar with Wexford, but it's on the map now for me, and I'll be definitely looking into it. So thank you for coming on in, Bob Marley. Uh let's see. Who else do we have? Uh, let's see. We have Stone Hobbit. Did I say Stone Hobbit? Yes, I did. I did. Well, welcome again, Stone Hobbit. Anyways, Corey stepped in the building saying, Rob G, you are the man. Corey, right back at you. You know, I'm, I, this, none of this gets done without support from people like you. 
uh, showing up and joining the conversation and keeping this thing moving, right? This is, it's what it takes. And so you are just the biggest part of this thing as I am. I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just keeping the conversation rolling. You know what I mean? But thank you for coming in, Corey. Thank you for letting us know how you feel. And it is totally appreciated. Uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think we are caught on up. So definitely want to thank everybody for coming on in tonight. Spaced Out Radio After Hours. Another strong week here at SOR. If you watched uh, any of the previous episodes today, if you didn't, you're going to be able to jump into the SOR time machine with us. As we go ahead and hop in and take a look at what happened this week, the week that was Spaced Out Radio. Uh, you may have missed something. If you did, don't worry about it. You can always jump into our archives, which are totally free, and check out anything that you've missed. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and take a look at the week that was Spaced Out Radio. Let's go ahead and, and jump into that right now. Nonetheless, you've been doing this for how many years now? Um, For... Since 2017, 2018. Okay, so yeah. since you since you've started this, how have you changed? What what have you changed in your mind, body, and soul? Um, I have so much more compassion, so much more compassion for anyone's story, <clears throat> because there's eight billion of us, and no two are the same. No two stories are the same in any sense. And when someone says, no, that didn't happen to you or has dimmed your light, as you had mentioned at the beginning, um, that's where I stand up behind you and I, I hold the light for you and make sure that you get it back. Okay. So what do you mean by dim the light? Um, if we had a teacher that said, like I had a teacher that told me my initials, she didn't like them because it was, um, she, she just didn't like them. So then I got confused. That was in grade school. Um, people that wouldn't let us speak up, uh, many of us got smacked in the mouth for speaking the truth as children. And all of those add up as time goes on. So when, when it comes to children having to experience this and you experience it, you know, reliving your own childhood trauma or anything, do we really know the extent of, of what we're going through on a spiritual level at that point? As children? No. Yeah. No, no, we don't. And that's why it's been a physical upgrade over the past five years because so many things attached specifically to me. I had pieces of energy attached that were never mine. They were from lower frequencies and lower energies. And then also the throat chakra, our ability to say what truly happened really gets slimmed down, especially when we go to school or if we're in religions. Um, I grew up Catholic, so that was one of the worst experiences, you know, some of us had because there wasn't much love in the Catholic church that I grew up in. I can ask you this. Who owns Wikipedia? What? Why can't we just go to them like we could to, say, Google or Apple or somebody to file a complaint about this type of stuff. They they start out with Jimmy Wales and uh, the other co-founder. I can't recall his name at the moment. Uh, he left in 2003 um, because he rejected where it was going. He's actually written three papers uh, in the last three years, uh, articles um, where he cites that Wikipedia is highly biased and not accurate. And uh, he's offering an alternative um, website to start information from and, and accumulating it on. Uh, they have a board of directors, but there's no phone call to call. You can submit an email to their to their board. You can try and file a complaint with the admins, uh, which is nowhere, it goes nowhere against the skeptics. Um, Girl skeptics are just one group that are part of the community of, of skeptics that control Wikipedia. And so, you try and call them, there is no calling them. There's really no, there's no really good recourse for if a person has a biography about them that is incorrect. Yeah, you know, like you know, even things as simple as lose uh, place of birth, you know, state of birth. 
you can't get it corrected by trying to call somebody and say, hey, I'll fax you over my passport or the supplying uh, documentation. There is no uh, appropriate remedy for living persons uh, to, to get a correction. Um, if the mainstream has, a, has an incorrect fact in it, then they go with it. They don't care. Um, they, Jimmy Wales said early on that he feels like the uh, skeptics that are on there serve a function to get rid of uh, what he believes are, um, what's the term? Um, he, had, he had a very derogatory term for people. Um, that, basically, anybody that didn't subscribe to their uh, to the scientific beliefs uh, were radicals that needed eradicated from the platform and that they serve that function and that they look after Wikipedia's best interests. So in that spirit, he argued that instead of normally on Wikipedia, one, you know, you have consensus by majority. So they, you know, one editor, one vote, but when, but when you have a, they can have a vote and they have a hundred percent that want to say like they want to delete a page. If a skeptic wants to overwrite it, they can come and say, uh, no, we're going to leave it. And there's no recourse. You can't argue with them. If you do, you get banned from the platform. Tim, I want to go right at you with this one. You were a paramedic, yeah? Yes. Um, you obviously saw a lot of a lot of death with your job. I see a lot of death with my job as well. Um, mm -hmm. Did you Do you have any stories? Like, have you had any experiences? Well, actually, you know, thinking back over the years, you know, I didn't think about it then, but, um, you know, we had a guy once, a knifing victim, you know, hundred, you know, 90 degree weather in the hot sun, we're doing CPR on him. And, you know, you do the CPR and the, your compressions and you do, someone checks the pulse. Well, I was doing compressions and I asked for a pulse and the guy passed away, unfortunately. But as I think back, I remember a cold swish coming up here. And over the years, I also thought about that, that um, I had it a couple other times that I experienced it when I was doing chest compressions and we lost the patient. I feel like a cold swish coming up and I'm over the center of the chest doing the compressions. So I've always wondered about that years later, thinking about it. And then, um, you know, and we've had, you know, I've had people ask me when I worked in the hospital, um, would I set up a camera if someone's gonna, if I know someone's gonna die? And I'm like, no, man, I, no, I don't do that. So, but the 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 cold swish will always always freak me out. Thinking back on it now, mm -hmm. that maybe that was you know the soul quote unquote leaving at yeah. that moment. And we've had you know we've we've had a lot of interesting deaths and um, you know and I've. I've never really gone because most of the scenes when well, I was a you know a street medic, so most of the scenes were public places and things like mm -hmm. that. But um, I've talked to other medics who've had similar, you know, yeah, yeah, I remember stuff like that. So I've always wondered about that over the years, and I've always talked to other medics that you know let them learn into it, but some guys um, have told me similar experiences about that. Demonic possession, you're learning about it. You're writing about it. Who is this young lady named Clara Fowler? Yeah, you know, uh, this takes place at the turn of the century, the, the 20th century. So it's 1898 to 1904 is the time period in uh, Back Bay, Boston, Beacon Hill, Boston. Um, she was a student at Radcliffe College uh, in her 20, early 20s, 22 years old. And uh, she went to a Dr. Putnam, uh, who was, again, one of the Boston Brahmin. These were all sort of high society, Harvard graduates, etc. So she wound up there suffering from what they called at the time neurasthenia. And neurasthenia was sort of a term they used for someone that was completely fatigued, run down, insomnia, couldn't sleep, uh, poor appetite, uh, lack of concentration. And, um, and just run down neurasthenia. Well, she went to Putnam with that, those, those um, symptoms, but then she started talking about horrible nightmares. And in her regular state, the, the Clara Fowler that came in, who was a quiet, 
studious kind of woman, very religious. As a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Prince, who wound up being her physician, referred to her as the saint because she had had visitations from Jesus Christ and from uh, the Virgin Mary. And, you know, she's very adamant about spatial time, you know, where she saw them, what they said, the conversations they'd have, and very religious. And that's the way she lived. Then all of a sudden she starts having these horrible nightmares. She um, wakes up in the morning and there's her clothes are shredded. Her money is ripped up. There may be a threatening letter that says, you know, when are you going to put a bullet through your head? This body is mine. And um, so she, she lives in fear of the nightmares so she doesn't sleep. When she tries to eat, she sees, you know, insects in her food, maggots in her food, so she, she can't eat. And um, she has these nightmares of robed figures, uh, being surrounded by robed figures, demons, uh, gremlin-type demons uh, on the posts of her bed. She tormented. So Putnam, who's a basically a general practitioner, says, you know, this is out of my league. But William James, the famous William James, is really the father of abnormal psychiatry and was the first to teach it in America at Harvard Medical School. And uh, Dr. Morton Prince, who was also one of the founders of behavioralism uh, in, in terms of psychiatry, he turned it over to them. Absolutely. So I want to ask you about your love of, of the technology of UFOs, because that's really what your book is on, is trying to figure out things like the propulsion system, the G-forces, the anti-gravity, and everything that allegedly we cannot do on this planet right now. Mm -hmm. I still think we can. Allegedly. Allegedly. For everybody listening at Area 51, and by the way, if you are part of an organization that is three letters, welcome to the show. We appreciate it. <laughs> But why take on the, what, or let me ask you this, what makes this fun for you in learning the possibilities of a brand new physics that we don't understand? I just love seeing those puzzle pieces fall into place and, and the overall image coming together as, as this part falls in and then that principle connects with that and it just, there's a symphony to science sometimes uh, when everything flows well. Um, and just seeing, I mean, when the iPhones first came out, everyone was passionate about the whole look and feel and the design of the iPhone, how sleek and slender. And then I think what those who have actually examined an NHI craft, they're ooing and aahing their brains out over the, the, the simplicity and the, the efficient, exquisite nature of how that those crafts are put together. So like okay. in my book, uh, yeah, please. I, I only feature one NHI craft and then all the other craft are man-made attempts to recreate or back engineer using different forms of technology that all dovetail into the same region of physics. Well, the, the, one of the sad things about it, I, I, I believe, is the idea that these good people who went out there to bring some awareness to the UFO cause didn't have any support from the community. You know, you had people out there, whether it was Danny Sheehan or others, who were advertising, you know, that this was going on. And nobody nobody went out there to really support them and, and, and to speak for those people. It's so weird. Like, you'd think maybe Tom DeLong would want to sing a song or hold a concert or something like that. Like, it's weird. I don't get it. I don't, I don't get, get it. it either. Can we call it a success? I think we could call it a good effort. We don't know the goals to call it successful. So, I mean, they got attention. They got heard. Um, they're being talked about. 
I did Schumer come out and like shake their hands and say thanks for your support? Whoa. Yeah, no, like no. that. I don't and, know. And it reminds me when, uh, for a radio audience who may not know the name, a lady named Anjali. She's she's trying to be like Madonna or Cher or Beyonce. Anjali oh, she's trying to protect her personal life from crazy mean people. Well, I'll take touche. Touche. I'll play the bad cop on this one. Who who held her own rally a couple of years ago, right on I think right in front of the steps of the of the of the that was Lincoln. great. I watched that live. And that, that, nobody showed up. Nobody that showed up. was that was unannounced either. Like it was whispered about. It could have had better support and planning around it as well. We said that at the time, like what a audacious thing to do right on the steps of the Capitol. There was decent people there surrounding her, but it could have been better. And we all got just walloped with her overabundant message. Like it was just, it was overwhelming. <laughs> All right, all right, all right. We're going to go ahead and jump back into the future as we took a look at what was this week at Spaced Out Radio. A lot of awesome stuff going on, as you saw, uh, you know, and, and it's all worth the rewatch. If you missed it, definitely hop up in the archives, youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio, and go ahead and jump back in and take a look at what you missed. That's what this review is for. Um, and I even missed a couple of these, so I'll definitely be doing the same thing. Uh, but with that being said, we're going to go ahead and have a really, really awesome show tonight. Uh, we have a great guest that I'm going to go ahead and bring in. And we're going to go ahead and get into some conversation, hear some experiences, and uh, a whole lot more tonight. So you guys sit back, kick back, relax, get what you need uh, for the show. We're going to go ahead and get this going. Let me go ahead and bring in our guest for the night. Experiencer and author... Mr. Jeff Selver. Hi, Jeff. How are you tonight? Good, Rob. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Yeah. So glad to have you here. Yeah. You know, we had this set up uh, a few weeks ahead uh, in advance, so I do appreciate you coming on in. Yeah. Um, you know, jumping right into it, uh, what I, I would like to do, especially being first time that we're talking, is if you wouldn't mind uh, kind of, you know, going back to the beginning, uh, talking about experiences you may have had or things that really drove you into uh doing what it is that you do today when it pertains to the phenomena yeah yeah okay so um <clears throat> this has been in my life for a long time and i didn't i wasn't aware of it actually and uh the memories were obscured and i had a strange event happen to me as a uh as a teenager, young, a young teenager. And um, the way I frame it is it was a, a consciousness event. And it was, uh, it happened to me, and it was extreme, and I got traumatized by it. And it had a message to leave my life. And uh, when I listened to that message, I ended up uh, traveling, like out of a well, I had a car out for the first year, and uh, out of a backpack for the several other two years, and uh, basically going place to place. Um, but I was seeing orbs and things in the sky, and I didn't quite understand that that was alien contact. I didn't under I didn't just you know I just didn't know that at the time, and uh, eventually, so it was, it was kind of a set of weird synchronicities that had me traveling. Then it was kind of a weird set of synchronicities that had it ending. And when it ended, uh, the ending was tied with meeting my uh, to-be spouse. And uh, when it ended, uh, the kind of orbs and stuff stopped in the sky. Uh, then I went about uh, living what I thought was a normal life. And uh, that happened for about 20 years. Um, I was unsettled by what had happened to me uh, in my 20s. And it was, it kinda, I didn't have answers for it. I recorded it. And I didn't quite understand what it was. By the time 2016 rolled around, I was trying to understand, I went back into that history trying to understand it. It took about three years to, uh, to the way I frame it was I was not an aliens and UFO guy. And it was uh, 2019 that um, uh, I'll, I'll give props to Jeremy Corbell. Uh, his 
video, his uh, documentary on Bob Lazar. And uh, that was the, uh, the, the video that made me take UFOs and aliens seriously. And I started to um, investigate. Uh, I basically found a YouTube video of uh, people's anomalous objects in the sky. And when I started watching uh, these videos, the orbs I had seen traveling had came back. And it was kind of like a door had opened up in my mind. And that, that, uh, that was the beginning of knowing something, uh, something maybe out of this world had happened to me. And, uh, and uh, I was terrified of it at first uh, and basically cracked the door open. I, there was a whole process that happened there that took um, months actually to understand. And, uh, once I uh, took those objects in the sky seriously, um, I was, uh, it was being paired with uh, flashbacks of having been on alien craft. And, uh, and it took time to understand what had happened to me. Um, but they were the reasons I went traveling. They were, they kind of initiated the consciousness event that happened. And uh, I didn't really um, <clears throat> understand it. I just had to kind of unravel the entire mystery and the memory set to understand what had happened to me. And, uh, and then the result was I just I needed to tell people. And the problem with my story, uh, it doesn't make sense individually. I think people, many people, have you know individual contact experiences with aliens, and uh, they can tell that story. And then maybe there's a witness, maybe there was a craft that a whole bunch of people saw. And I don't have any of that. And my story doesn't actually make sense unless it's all kind of put together. And uh, so I was very quickly putting it into writing and I was showing people all the contact events and it kind of just made sense at the time that it, that it would be a book because I felt like I, I it couldn't be taken seriously unless it was people were understanding the why, like why were the aliens doing the first contact event? Why were they doing the second one and the third one? And uh, unless you understood the whole picture of what they were trying to accomplish. And that's what created the book. And it turned out, I didn't know until much later, the, the memory of the kind of the 25th contact event that they actually wanted that. And that was part of the impetus. The subconscious impetus was for me to get this stuff out into a book for the public to understand what had happened to me. And I only, you know, within the last you know, year and a bit, maybe two years, uh, this is valuable. People understand it's, it's helping them understand the phenomenon. And then that makes a lot of sense why they wanted that. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. So looking at this, uh, and, and I know we have your book here. Let me see if I can bring it up here. Um, it was, uh, when I saw this, it was pretty interesting with the title here. So you have, and this, uh, everyone, you can find this on Jeff's website, uh, jeffselver.com. Um, but we have the rising and alien and, and the alien plan to build an enlightened city on earth. Uh, would you mind explaining that and kind of what, what went into uh, writing this book? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah. So, uh, basically, okay. The rising is the consciousness event. So actually the gray alien basically said it's, it's your time to rise. And so there was a contact event, um, uh, right before the, it occurred. And, and that's how she framed it. She called it's your time to rise. And so it was, you know, she was referring to this consciousness event and that's why the title of the book ended up being, cause it was about that specific thing they did with me. And, um, and then there's a separate part of the story, which is um, quote unquote, we're coming. And uh, they really wanted, well, she, the, this alien I was largely interacting with wanted me to, tell people the public through a book that um they were coming and that's the purpose of the hybrids was to put them on planet earth and then upon telling me that she's showing me a vision and uh the vision is a city a city of like a a beautiful emerald metallic city and uh and I call it enlightened uh, largely because I am of what I understood about my experience with them, that uh, this was consciousness, the entire phenomenon, at least for me, and I can just repeat this and I have a lot of, I feel like there's evidence now for this, the entire phenomenon is consciousness and uh, about consciousness. It's all roots back into uh, not that we are not the, you know, that we are not the body and that we are an energy form outside the body. And, uh, and then that part of you, can interact with their tech 
it's 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 quite uh, I just humans don't have a frame of reference for this stuff. And so enlightened when I call it enlightened, it was what I understood about them that it's it, we need to be enlightened to kind of interact with them. We need to have those kind of at least those principles of what we in our world, what we call enlightened. And we need to have those ideas understood just to even, you know, be interacting with these entities. And also, you know, I'm pretty certain to interact with their tech. I'm pretty certain they're they're pretty nice about this stuff. There's a lot of contact events where they share tech. And I think that says a lot that uh, that they're very okay with doing that. And that's how it kind of got framed in my in my contact events with the city. The idea is, you know, people are able to come. There has to be a, a level of understanding about who and what you really are, which is this, you know, an energy form uh, outside, you know, an energy form within the body, I guess. Yeah, so that's the title, the gist of it. You know, and that that makes a, a lot of sense I, because I, I find myself uh, as we all go on this journey, I find myself uh, looking at different aspects of the phenomena and trying to figure it out just like everyone else. And and it's interesting that your outlook on the phenomena is that this is a completely a consciousness sort of thing. So if I, if I'm understanding that right. Are you are you stating uh, that that uh, e even when it comes down to extraterrestrial um, abductions, that those are also consciousness events? Or because I, I've always asked the question to uh, abductees if they felt like their experience was a physical one, or if it was possible that maybe their consciousness was what was actually being abducted. What is your outlook on that? Like, is that what you're saying? Or are you saying something a little different than that? Yeah. What I'm saying is uh, their world, uh, when we have access to that world, um, uh, they're going to prove the afterlife is real. They're going to prove paranormal is real. They're going to prove there is a spirit or an energy out form that, that survives death that lives. So we are not just the body. Um, they're going to prove past lives are real. They're, they can do that with the tech. So everything is altered. The entire perception of what it even means to be a human is, is we're just different. We're going to be different. We're going to not know where we don't know what we are now is the bottom line. Right. And we are going to, uh, uh, you know, we're going to learn what we really are. And so that right there, uh, that's, that's the gist of what it is when I say it's all consciousness. And then the beings themselves, the tech, uh, these crafts, you had a guy on there, um, you know, previously with the uh, SRO, SOR, uh, re replay, and he was talking about the tech, about the, you know, the crafts. And, mm -hmm. you know, the reality is, is that they're wired to God. <laughs> they're using quantum, there's something going on here. There's quant, they're quantum, you know, quantum field crafts. The crafts are alive. And so they're utilizing you know, the God field or the soul field or whatever, whatever that thing is, whatever, because we call it God. I don't know what they call it, um, but it's whatever that thing is, they're able to utilize that as an energy form or as an energy source. Yeah. And so people have, you can have very wild experiences on crafts. And so, you know, people can drive the craft and they can unify with it. I think I heard one contactee story where she, she she was told to you know connect with the craft she would put her hands on this pad but then she could feel all the individuals on the craft when she connected to it she could feel out every single one of them who was all on the craft uh there's like unity that's a you know that's kind of a concept of what we met people would meditate about uh so that's what so when i say it's about consciousness they've utilized it to a degree that humans are not even i don't even think we're ready to understand yeah. that it's so it's such a huge jump now, when it comes to the abduction phenomenon, I think that that explains some of the, you know, the challenges that it, that that the that 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 that, that phenomenon was actually about or is about for people. And the 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 things I really zero in on about, you know, the abduction phenomenon and how that that can be challenging for people. And I'm very aware. And I have my own. The story does have my own version of it. I have. I was used for the hybrid program. So there, there is a biological exchange and it got messy at one point and I didn't want to be a part of it. And so that is part of my story. So I am definitely aware of where it can go. Um, but there is an element of, okay, then they are in this other kind of space about consciousness. They're in a, um, 
the best way to frame it is that they're detached and not, they're not just detached. That's, it's not just the best, it's not the best way to frame it. They are not just detached. This, the, the only way I can understand this is the way humans relate to animals. So we are one, a type of brain and, and we, you know, we have sciences and we have, you know, physics. And then when we're dealing with a bear and we know that we have to work with that bear because the bear is maybe carrying a disease, we have no ability to communicate with the bear. We don't have the ability to tell it about our world, to help it understand why we need to bring it into our labs to, you know, do something to it. So right. we traumatize, we could likely traumatize the bear, right? By, sh you know, shooting it with a gun, uh, which, you know, puts it under. And then uh, that could be, you know, very traumatizing for an animal. And yet the people doing it are actually very, you know, they're, they're, they have their hearts set on saving that bear. So they're actually very kind and very compassionate, but there's no way in the two different worlds to translate that. Yeah. And I think something like that is what goes on here where there's, for me, I, pr I'm proven. That's what my story is about. I, I have a degree where I prove to myself that this stuff is sitting in a consciousness space that humans are not familiar with at all. Meaning their, their frame of reference of reality is out of ours. We don't even have a way of holding it. So when they're interacting with humans, they may not just be, you know, devil, evil, evil demon creatures, <laughs> they actually might be doing something that's actually maybe benevolent even, and we have no way of understanding that. And, uh, and so uh, here, let me give the example of what they actually do show me in my contact events, which are in the book. Um, so I have a, I have a year of biological events. Here, actually, how it goes is they did the rising to me. So the, the consciousness event, and it had a genetic component to it. So they altered my genes. And then I became valuable to them like biology biologically and i didn't know that actually it felt like i was kind of deceived in at the time and so for an entire year the year 1998 actually they um were taking my biology and at first i was intimidated by it and but i let it happen because i've already hey they're powerful the entities are powerful they i don't even understand how to you know how, how you would like fight against them so i was but I was also getting things out of the, the, the exchange too. They were showing me things about their world. So it was kind of this weird thing where I felt, okay, I'll, I'll go along with this as long as this doesn't get too hairy. And then by the end of 1998, it got really hairy and it got really hairy fast. And, uh, and I don't have, I only have the words hairy. I don't want to use any other words uh, to the point where I was fighting them and I'm yelling and I don't want them. And I told you, you lied to me and, and I'm feeling like I got duped. And then they ended by showing me uh, uh, the best way to frame it is that my higher self, the part of me that was born before this, this life um, actually agreed to this. And I mean, I'm missing other, I'm missing parts of the story yet, which is that they, sh I had an interaction on the craft very early on in the story where I saw my higher self. And I, I, I've, I've the only way to understand these things. I mean, this is even just, as I say this, I know uh, this is going over people's heads, but like, I'm, I prove again to myself that, you know, the higher self is the intuitive part of you. So it's a, the higher self is the fully personified intuitive you and, you know, the no space, no time you. And so I'm shown very early on in a 16 year, when I'm 16 year old in 1993 in a contact event that I'm, that I made an agreement with them in the afterlife. And so I, I, I I'm on board with them and then they do the biological stuff and I kind of almost like forget about it or, or like lose understanding of that, or, or I just don't even, you know, I don't know how to frame what's happening with the biological stuff with this higher self stuff. So I, I kind of like, just, it seems to not be part of the picture. I just start fighting them. And then they, and then when they end the biological stuff, they show me my higher self again. And I want, I instantly have a moment of recognition uh, on the craft when they're showing me this, um, that I did, like I could feel my higher self got something out of the interaction with them. So it was an exchange. It, it actually is the one saying, no, no, no. I know this was, you know, kind of awful for you, but the bottom line is that we're, you and me, the higher self is kind of saying that to me in that moment, we're getting something out of this. And that's beneficial to us and or beneficial to me is really, you know, I am the higher self, but when you don't know that you're kind of feeling like a separation from it. So yeah. So the bottom line is that's how I can end up framing my contact events, that there was this other, you know, dimensional level that had a, that had a level of intellect and understanding that wasn't in my, in my regular human brain. So um, now are all abduction phenomena, 
you know, events like that. I don't know. But um, I do see a lot of patterns that reflect that when I hear about people's contact, when I hear about, you know, the kind of more uh, harder or the, 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 the intense contact events, you know, with which people maybe got traumatized. But, but again, it's really hard to separate these that we're dealing with entities from another dimension. So, yeah. Yeah, I think you make, <clears throat> excuse me, I think you make some good points there. Uh, I'm gonna go back a little bit because to kind of relay what you what you just said here. So it makes a lot of sense when you talk about uh, the fact that this is a consciousness thing. And it makes sense because when you have uh, the question is always put out there on why some people have experiences when then others don't some can be in the same place one can see it and the other the other may not yeah. and it and it makes sense that you may need to be have that enlightenment in order to do so that just makes a lot of sense and then the example that you give uh with the with the bear with the bear situation i'll go a step further i mean that that same scenario where you have humans that may have the best interests of this animal at heart uh, pick an animal and and they they don't understand what it is that we're trying to do and that this is for their best interest now but you do have the rare case where you may have one of those animals uh you know bears dolphins uh that just seem to understand that seem to relax and and are okay with yeah. what's going on and that could be that animal's enlightenment that allows it to understand what our intentions are. And so that everything that you're saying there makes a lot of sense. I kind of wanted to just, you know, recap that and, and show how those things actually do connect. And I'm a person that feels like uh, a lot of these questions that we have, if we just sit and talk through it like we're doing now, a lot of common sense and logic comes into play and it kind of makes things make sense. So yeah. just to go off of what you're saying there. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. And I, you're just hitting all the nails on the head. It's perfect actually. Yeah. And it's, and we're just dealing with, I mean, they're saying it now, you know, we got David Grush saying it's dimensional and, you know, they have the house committee saying, repeating to the media dimensional. So like, then we just have to accept we're dealing with something that we actually, you know, we, we will need different a set of glasses or a different frame of reference to understand it then. And, uh, and we can't be ignorant. We can't, we can't, we can't have our emotional mind actually be the one to take over and, and be angry when maybe we were not able to under comprehend what we were dealing with. And we have to take a step back and, and then therefore, yeah, as a collective, even uh, debate or understand uh, in ways that, uh, you know, help us move forward with this. Yeah, and it makes sense when you even look at uh, one of your peers, just someone else who uh, who you try to explain the phenomena to and it just doesn't click for them. And it's just it, the, it, the answer could be just as simple as they just haven't reached that point of enlightenment yet where it makes sense for them. Right. But then at the same time, doing what we're doing here kind of does help to unlock those things within people, which is why I love having these conversations. But then you also pointed to uh, th that other part of you, that that higher self, which, you know, just to kind of put in layman's terms for some people, I'm, you know, people, if you've ever sat back and had a conversation with yourself, right? So that 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 other part of you that is answering back to you within your mind is that higher self, you know what I mean? And it, it just shows that there's a whole nother level to this consciousness aspect and why all this makes sense. So I'm totally with you on that. I think consciousness is actually the key. Uh, and then you go back to uh, when you're talking about some people who, who on the surface, when they say, yeah, uh, I was aboard this craft and I was able to control it by touching the console. It makes sense, right? Because we're all energy and it would make sense that uh, you felt static electricity and some of the invisible energies that are around you. It would make total sense that uh, something like the energy that powers you is is, uh, you know, and it plays an important part in operating these ships. 
And, you know, like I said, though, on the surface for someone just hearing it, they're like, ah, oh, that sounds wild. But when you really sit down and start talking about it and talking through it, you find out that a lot of these things that you thought were way off actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Bang on. Yeah, you got it. And and then, you know, it starts maybe on making sense why there wasn't disclosure. Right. It starts making sense why we were dealing with something so incomprehensible. And I'm not even convinced that, you know, if someone in the 50s or 60s or 70s, like we didn't have quantum physics, even as a frame of reference. It existed, but it wasn't it wasn't even validated until I think the 80s. So it's like we just didn't have a frame of reference for this stuff. So it makes sense where you can see humans pushing back from, you know, these crazy aliens. And what is this weird stuff? And and I actually, you know, I kind of a part of me also just has compassion for you know, how challenging this, this stuff is because <laughs> it is, it's even for the contactees, it's challenging. It's not like it's, I can only imagine, you know, if someone from the fifties who's, who's first hand, you know, having this information. So yeah, yeah, this is a, a new era we're moving into with this. Yeah. And I, and like I said, just to kind of go back to what I was just saying, I think it really, a really good way to point that out is just, is, is some of the examples that we have of other species of animals here on earth that we have interfaced with that, uh, on the surface we see maybe there's 1% of them that kind of can have that connection with us where it's an unspoken thing where it just seems like they know what you're what your intentions are and they're kind of okay with it versus the 99 percent of the same species that would uh, try to attack you and just wouldn't really understand what it is that you're trying to do and it, if you take that example and then you apply it to humans dealing with this phenomena it you could see it as the same thing that there's only going to be the one percent right now that really get it uh, that, that can kind of, you know, consciously understand what's going on versus the 99% of us out here that just, uh, don't get it. So, yeah. um, I think, I think we're on the right path with that here. Um, did, did, yeah, you go ahead. I just want to let you know, we have like two, three, three minutes before break. So you can go ahead and wrap it up. Yeah, no worries. Actually the, uh, you know, you're hitting on, you know, thought of this stuff all pretty thoroughly because it involved me so intensely. Um, Fearlessness is actually the like uh, uh, lack of fear of death is actually I think what's needed for the human to interact with this phenomenon because uh, if you think you're the body and you think you're the brain um, then you're not accustomed to the you know the level you need to be at to just even interact with the tech never mind actually having one of these entities these aliens interacting with you uh, through their telepathy and. Uh, I think that that level of fearlessness is the is the push that actually needs to happen uh, for the human to uh, to interact with them, and I think that might be what you're talking about here when you have a certain yeah versus an animal versus a, a kind of the human interacting with the, these these uh, these entities, yeah, because it's going to uh, it's the, it's actually in, very much in line with the, the paranormal phenomenon, right? I kind of use the, the ghost as the example. Why are people scared of ghosts? Well, all a ghost is is an invisible human, but uh, but we it touches something about us because we don't have that part of ourselves awakened. So we actually get very terrified of the idea of a ghost. Never mind one being in our presence. And uh, but it's all it's doing is touching the part of ourselves. And I think the aliens do the exact same thing. They touch that that uh, spirit or that dimensional aspect of our own selves, and we have an innate uh, terror of it. Uh, but it's really a fearlessness that we need to move through. Uh, to embrace and interact with that uh, phenomenon. Yeah. Perfectly put, perfectly put. Yeah, because if you, it, and I think that's that you explained it perfectly, really, uh, you know, most of those people who haven't reached that enlightenment only live within themselves in the physical, in, in with their physical brain, and they, they can't fathom that things could, could surpass that into this world where, you know, and, and I explain it in a way where I feel like all energies are interconnected. So it, whether it's ours, other animals, these planets, what moves these planets, what powers the universe, all the way up the chain that all these energies are interconnected. 
And so e even though you just like Wi-Fi is present uh, all around you, you don't see it. It's just in a spectrum that you can't see at this moment. But if you were able to put on some glasses that allowed you to see the spectrum, you would realize that everything is touching everything. And all it takes is uh, almost like a rock in the water and the wave goes out and reaches the other coast or whatnot, that everything is interconnected. So with that being said, Jeff, we're jumping into some good stuff. I do definitely want to pause for the cause, though, so we can take this break. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, kick back. Uh, we will be back with our guest here, Jeff Silver. And please go ahead and get your questions ready. Put them in caps. Uh, we'll ask those on the second half of the hour as we come back with hour number two of Spaced Out Radio. After hours, we'll see you in just a minute.
All right, guys. Welcome back to Spaced Out Radio After Hour Number Two with me, your host, Mr. Rob G, and our guest here, Jeff Silver. We were getting into some real deep stuff when it comes to consciousness. Uh, I do want to start real quick and talk to all the space travelers out there. Since you're already a space traveler, think about taking that extra step and join the club. That's right. You can join our SOR Spaced Out Radio Space Travelers Club for as little as five buckaroonies by jumping on over to our Patreon and showing your love and support there. So really would appreciate if you guys would do that. And uh, go ahead and jumping back in real quick. I do want to go ahead and address one thing real quick. Uh, Brandon Coast had a couple questions here. Uh, I believe this is for me. So what is the alien head supposed to be since this is about a real experience? And I need to know if the alien head is a representation of what he saw. No, the alien head that you guys see in the upper right corner of your screen that is the rob g alien head you can get that at our sor at spacedoutradio.com forward slash shop that is one of our uh, uh logos for the merch so that is me that is my uh extraterrestrial counterpart and you can get those on t-shirts we have underwear we have socks all those things over at spacedoutradio.com forward slash shop. So Brandon Coast, talk to Castle Dude. He already has some uh, Rob G draws over there. And uh, yeah, so that's what that is. It has nothing to do with what Jeff is uh, here talking about tonight. Just wanted to make that clear real quick. Uh, so back with you, Jeff. So, um, you know, we had on the title of our thumbnail talked about uh, 26 alien gray encounters. Yeah. Yeah, I know some of this stuff is probably in the book and wanted to know if you wouldn't mind kind of jumping into some of that stuff. Uh, you know, some of the things that you're able to tell us without giving up, you know, everything in the book. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so what are you asking for? Like the kind of layout of the, the 26? Yeah, maybe even the first one, uh, some of the first few that kind of really were like, wow, okay, this is something strange. Yeah. Sure, okay. Um, okay, so... <clears throat> Um, the entire set starts when I'm 16 and I call it the first contact event because it is where I guess the relationship starts and, um, I have childhood contact events and, uh, they're kind of brief if you will, but, uh, they're impersonal. And, uh, and the last one I found the, when I was seven years old, was, uh, it kind of scared me actually. That's, I was scared as a seven year old for having the the contact event and so there's five childhood contact events and so there's this kind of impression already and everything it everything gets sealed up the entities i mean they don't even really fully explain how they do that but uh they seal everything up and then when i'm 16 years old um believe it or not i'm reading whitley streber's book 1993 uh and i am uh, it's kind of a weird thing. I had like this kind of interest in UFOs and aliens when I was a kid and I try, kind of put it all away. And then now I'm 16 again and I'm like, Oh, I, I really want to get back into, you know, something to do with aliens. I just loved that content. And it's really weird uh, because it was this drive from having this childhood contact events I didn't know about. And when I read Whitley Strieber's book, I got excited in the middle and I like always remembered this and I closed the book I slapped it closed and I prayed in the sky out, out of like excitement to be abducted. I was 16 years old and they answered and I didn't know about it. That's how twisted this is. So I'm coming home one night and everything happens outside. Nothing happens in beside a bed. And uh, though there, there are several I'm taken from the bed, but there's nothing in my house. I never have no memories of any alien in my house. And, uh, and so this contact event 16, I'm walking home from, uh, from being with uh, friends and, um, and uh, basically something falls out of the sky and it lands and I freak out and it freezes me. And, uh, and it's really just a terrifying moment. And the, basically it's trying to get my permission. So it's actually, it's like, it's okay. We're not going to harm you. And it's, it's emoting telepathically. And, uh, and what's happening is that the presence, I don't even understand it. Is this a dimension? I don't fully know, but all the memories open up and, and I don't really process it. I have no way of quickly processing that. All I know is that there's some kind of level of familiarity, but I didn't quite get it. And this thing is saying, it's okay. And I'm kind of terrified trying to get out of being frozen. And it's like, it's okay. We're not going to harm you. 
And then it's asking, it's like, come, come with us, come with us to our ship, come. And I'm like, like frozen. And and then I'm actually like, rem- it, there's a moment, either maybe it's kind of forcing the memory in my mind, or maybe I'm the one who remembers, I don't know, but there is a, mem- a moment of like, what? Like, I remember this thing, there's something about it. And then I, I actually give permission and I actually say, okay. And then it takes me. And then I get taken up in the craft and there's a craft. I didn't even know there was a craft there and I get taken up by the craft. And then, um, and, uh, when I'm inside, basically it's a long story, but the bottom line is that they actually want my agreement. They show me my future and there's something very interesting in that, in my future for them. And it's, it's, it's the traveling thing, but I don't really know how to frame any of this in the moment and I don't understand it, but she's explaining, um, that I have their DNA. And it actually, there's a, a series of conversations, but what ends up happening is it makes sense. I actually, it explains some things that were going on with me at the time. Um, uh, and it also explained why I felt the way I did with them. And so they wanted this agreement. And the idea was they wanted, they were going to help me discover my soul. And then there were these kind of time periods that they would do things. This first time period is that we're going to work with you and develop you and and do that. And then the second time period is we're going to watch you and it's kind of an experiment on their behalf. So I agree to do that. Um, so then there's a medical thing that terrifies me, a medical procedure that I found very terrifying, but it really didn't harm me too much. But um, I just didn't like being on the medical bed. And then afterwards, they're like, OK, come to this room. And uh, <clears throat> the room is what I call the white room. And it is uh so this was an agreement to discover my soul that very contact event they were this this is them you know doing that they're going to show me my soul and uh, and then they would seal up that memory though they didn't explain that um uh, so they i go into a white room and uh this room is um it's uh massive <clears throat> it's empty and it's it's uh much larger on the uh it's much larger than it should be for the craft. So it has this kind of effect going off and kind of football fields distance around me and even actually even below me. And so there's a feeling of like that I'm walking on air and it's having an effect on me. And I, I'm not really clear actually I'm hyperventilating, um, but I feel good. So I'm not really clear. I, I'm not really clear. Maybe the, maybe the room didn't even have air or I'm not even really clear. And yet I'm still functioning in some kind of way in the room whatever, I don't really fully understand that part, but I, they dissolve the body. I start levitating and they dissolve the body. And I'm, what's left is the ethereal me, the ghost me, I guess. And then that collapses and I become an orb. And, um, and it is uh, incomprehensible what ends up happening. Uh, I, it's a blish rush is the only way to frame it. I experience unity with the craft with them, I also experience unity. So they all, it all happens to them too. And these terrifying looking aliens were not terrifying anymore. And now they were just these core energies and I was a core energy. And it's, it's ecstasy, it's, it's elation. It's, it's this hyper joy. It's, it's a, uh, it's child purity, hyper joy. And, uh, and, and I, the identity got erased too. There was no, I was not a 16 year old anymore. And they started to play and they were whipping around playing. And then I was whipping around playing with them. And, uh, and it's a huge thing that ends up happening, alters me. She becomes eventually at some point, she becomes a a portal after a lot of play and lights things going on in the room. She becomes a portal and she wants me to come in. And um, what ends up happening is a sequence of, of me witnessing the afterlife. First, as I show up, as I go into this this room as an orb, or I start into her as a into this portal as an orb, I I witness the death of my last life. So they're showing me what what this will become is an arch of the death of my last life, me in the afterlife, and then the birth of me. And so I'm witnessing this death, and I'm having shared experience with it. So what I can I can only understand I can only imagine I can only assume on what I'm watching are holograms and that, but they're holograms of real events because I'm having shared experience with it. And it's, it's instantaneous recognition. That's me. I can feel it's me. 
And uh, so I'm witnessing the death of my last life. And then it starts kind of, you know, it's crying. It, and it was, I could feel the passage of time. So I knew it was in the thirties or forties at that time. I wasn't, you know, thinking that way. I can own in the memory. I can understand that that's what that was thirties uh, or forties. And, and then it's done, it's crying as it's moving up, moving up, moving up. And it goes into the, this veal, it passes a veal and it becomes the higher self. And I'm witnessing everything and I'm having shared experience with it. This afterlife, this, this higher self, um, she, the alien is behind me in this kind of weird, ethereal way. And she's like, watch this. And as she, as I watch the, this, this, this old, this past me move into the afterlife. And then what happens is the higher self becomes a, you know, it's this dimensional person, it's this dimensional entity. That's me that, and I, as I say, it's my intuitive self. It's my no space, no time self fully personified as its own thing. And then they overlay it with an image of a, of a man with a beard and a gown, a white gown. So, and it has a weird archetypal feeling to it, but it's very dimensional. So there's this kind of feeling I can pick up from behind it. Like as if it's through it, it's actually a dimensional entity. And I can kind of feel the overlay of the image. And uh, there's a sequence of events here. What they're showing me is she, uh, uh, right away, as soon as this higher self comes out of this past, this last life, a great alien approaches it. And so they're showing me my higher self made an agreement with gray aliens. Um, there's a series of events that occur. They're kind of like slots, like they're pieces of, like as I kind of frame it, that's almost like it's Photoshop, like real events in this dimension, all Photoshopped together. So it's a sequence of events that they want me to see. And um, let's just frame it that uh, a lot happens and I see, uh, I see them, I see the preparation of me. I see my higher self going to a grid that has gray alien bodies. So humans on earth, uh, family lines that have gray alien bodies that have gray alien DNA, I mean. And, uh, and so my higher self is on a grid using it to build me. Um, they, I get, I get basically shown how I get prepped is basically how it works, what happens. And then it ends by them, uh, me being an orb, they're showing me as a blue orb being put into my mother's womb. And then it's like a birth. And then I get popped out of that portal that I was in and I'm altered. I'm a 16 year old. I'm, uh, if they left me like that, I would have had a full on psychological traumatic split because I was not, I'm, I'm in the body of the 16 year old, but I'm now that thing that I just witnessed. And I'm, I'm in shock. I'm actually in pretty much traumatic shock. And uh, cause I'm now I'm confused. Who's who, who's who? Like, am I, am I the 16 year old or am I that thing? I just witnessed this afterlife and this higher self and all this past life stuff. And, and then, but they don't care. They, they kind of funnel me through. They're like, okay, now let's go. And they, they uh, just another bunch of things happen that are just related to the story too complex. Bottom line is that they kind of get ready for me to go back home. And I put clothes on because I, because of the medical thing I had with my clothes, uh, as my underwear. And then I'm, I'm basically altered and, uh, and they're like, okay, hey, we'll see you again. And that's it. And they fire me back. There's a telepathic message on the, uh, where, where they caught me walking home, go home. And I walk home and I'm altered. I actually remember this, but you know, when you're 16 and if something happens like this, where they erase the memory of it. And you're 16, I wasn't self-reflective. I don't have that. It's a weird thing. Like you develop self-reflection, right? And so they remove the, the knowledge of it and then they remove, uh, and then I'm left with a feeling, but I can't identify where the feeling comes from. And then I have a wild dream that night and, uh, and I go home and I do remember the kind of state I was in going home, but I, it just, over time, it just goes away. Like if that's you're just, you're just, you're your 16 year old self and you're not thinking about it. I have a weird dream at home and that's it. that's it. That dream is the imprint. And I remember the night because of the dream I had. So uh, the dream lasted, was a memory. It, it was in my journal. That's how personal it was. And basically a dream that I was floating on that spot where I had the contact event. I was floating above the trees and I felt deep and mystical and I couldn't understand why I, why I had this dream. And, uh, and that was it. And then the whole thing gets buried. And then they come back. Uh, they start coming back and, it, and at first it's a year and a bit. And so I don't have any contact events. There's nothing. They just take this awareness and they seal it all up. And then every time they're opening me up, 
I got, I have a, I have a shock. I have, because it's this power, it's this thing that bursts out. Uh, so the second contact event, the third contact event, the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh are all this buildup of what they had done. So, and it becomes like a, uh, an embodiment. So they, I saw my intense higher self. I saw this energy and then, I'll, and then slowly over about two or three years, uh, after several contact events, it's becoming more and more embodied. Now, as a human being, as my everyday life, all I'm thinking is that I'm having, like, uh, all the psychic stuff picks up. So I start having past life awareness. I start, I start, I can't wait to die because I just want to be an energy form outside my body. And I have synchronicities. There's kind of weird magic going on in my life. And I have, par I have the psychic events happening. And I think it's all just natural. That's the trick. I think everything is just a product of me reading the right books. All the contact events, the first seven, were this kind of development. So they did, I, saw, I was using their consciousness tech, um, and they were doing some things with my body. There was, they had, I saw my thoughts laid out on a computer screen. So I get to witness their kind of consciousness tech. It's very fascinating. And it was all for this development of this consciousness thing that they would do with me, which is the rising. Um, to keep the story short, I already kind of explained the rising in the, in the, uh, in the intro. Um, that happened in 1997. So that first contact event was 1993. The consciousness rising was 1997, seven contact events in between. And then the year 1998 is when all the biology starts and it's the most contact events I have. It's all boom, 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 boom. Some of them are like once a month, boom, 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 one after the other. And, but they're, the entire thing is an exchange in our mind. So they're like, thank you for doing this. What do you want? from us and I want to see who they are. So I, I get to go to a city. So the eighth contact event after the rising, um, they now all the trauma, all the emotions and the detail, the trauma, it's all laid out in the book. So you can get the gist of that. Um, but the cool parts are that uh, uh, the eighth contact event after the rising, after a biological event, she says, what, what do you want from us? Like, thank you for doing this with us. Where do, what do you want from us? And I'm like, I want to see where you live. And she says, we live on Venus. And uh, and that doesn't make sense. <laughs> and so I don't understand. And then she says, like, like, okay, you'll go. So I get to see where they live. So I I I I get into a craft. I actually I get a. Uh, it's kind of complex. She gives. She passes me off to a humanoid, not a human. A humanoid alien. And then he's young like me. So there's kind of a bonding and that she wants me to obviously like kind of bond with this guy. And, and, and it's all telepathy and he's like, Hey, and so it's, everything's like all nice. Everything's really sweet and nice and fun, except there's like biological contact events. And I'm in this like kind of other dimensional, you know, alien world. And, uh, and I'm really excited. I get to, he wants me to drive the craft. So he's basically showing me how to drive the craft. It's absolutely out of this world. Um, I, I drive the craft from here to Venus out in empty space. Um, I've done everything I can to show that this stuff is real. I have cooperations. I mentioned them in presentations I've done before that I had cooperations where, where Venus was in the year 1998 and April, uh, April, March or April, yeah, April of 1998. Uh, and so I knew like these details. I, I also, anyway, and, uh, so I'm driving the craft and then he takes over as we go into Venus and I'm witnessing Venus on, on the screen and it's just, it's, uh, it's just mind blowing. And, uh, and uh we go through the atmosphere into the rocky landscape and they're not explaining anything to me and so i actually go to this i i'm watching the city coming up upon us and it doesn't make any sense like why is there a city here this doesn't make sense and you know i don't know if i knew exactly all the degree all the, the math behind venus at the time all the, the 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 temperature and the pressure and the chemical stew that it is but i knew it was unha uninhabitable that's for certain and so i just don't understand this and the craft lands and the door opens up on, sorry, the craft lands on a pad outside on the, in, outside the, like in the atmosphere. And there's like a pad that connects to the city and the door opens and I'm like not understanding. And I'm actually, can we, can we breathe this? And he's like, yeah, the air is normal, he says. And then he walks out and I walk out and I'm able to be in the atmosphere. Um, and all I have is that were phased or something. I, there are no explanations given to me and I'm out in the Venus atmosphere and the, the kind of mustard yellow hue. Uh, it's all just absolutely mind blowing and fascinating. 
And then we walk into a uh, the city, and the city is just it's it's not a normal city. It's not it's not a the hard edged buildings like human cities. It's all curves, cones, um, very different shapes. And there's kind of a central structure that all the all the tall buildings are a part of. And we walk into the central structure, and there are aliens everywhere, and uh, and humanoids as well too. Uh, but I definitely see tall gray aliens. And I also see what I basically am convinced are kind of mantis creatures, these things that we call mantis, though we seem to not fully understand what these things are yet. Um, tall, lanky creatures with kind of snouts and big big cat eyes. And uh, anyway, I go to, he shows me where they live because I want to see how they live. That was actually the kind of the direct wording and they show me exactly that. So I see where the humanoid lives it's basically a condo. It can't be any different, except that the the environment is like molded. It's like a just everything is like as if it came out of a, a production line. The entire building came out of a production line. Uh, it's just a molded single single mold uh, environment. And uh, and then I see the gray aliens environment and uh, the, her home. And so it's personal, right? They're also making, they're giving, giving me that connection. I'm bonded to them. I have this very like kind of connecting connection with them as we do this. So it feels very trusting. And, uh, and then that contact event ends. And then it's the 9th, the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, uh, 15th, sorry, not the 16th, all biology. And it just gets more and more intense. And it starts playing on my mind. Um, at this point, the 10th contact event, I see the hybrids. That's the first time I learn what their plans are. And I learn why they're, in they're interacting with humans, why they're interacting with our planet, what's going on. And for them, it's the planetary destruction. It's that uh, we're on the tipping point and, and, and they, everything's symbolic. They show me in holograms, uh, consciousness holograms, these holograms that you can feel. You can feel the information. It's like, it's, a, it's like a third level, a third dimensional level of information just parted imparted into your consciousness or your mind, I guess, maybe even. And, and I feel from this consciousness hologram that the planet is actually falling up. Basically uh, humans are taking away all the resources and, and we're putting strain on so much strain on the planet. It blows up into flames, goes up in flames and then they take over and it's taking over is a, it's not the exact right word. It's not the human frame of reference of taking over, but it is a, we're going to change the way things are done around here. And, mm -hmm. uh, and though they are benevolent and they're nature lovers, actually the aliens that I know are, are life preservers. They actually, and it's kind of, they might see us as not being life preservers. It's kind of this other twist that around. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then the hybrids are actually a part of that process of the integration. And I basically get explained that they are planning to integrate like uh, societies, put two societies together, marry to merge. Uh, to, so not to dominate, not to eradicate, not to, like not these human concepts. I actually think that they're just, they take nature and they just are an aspect of nature. Uh, and then the hybrids are all part of this and they really are looking for, you know, the merging of the two worlds. And, uh, and I can explain that in the 10th contact events. Um, they're basically having contact events. So that's 1998. I travel for 1999. There's only like uh, four, four contact events in 1999. And, and, Everything has a purpose. Nothing is done with, nothing is fleeting. It's either to guide me in the moment because I'm off rail for what they want or in what I also want, what my higher self agreed to. So they can actually, they do guide me several times. And then at other times it's like they're aware that, that they will, that I'm part of something with which will go public. So they're telling me information. And at one point I get to ask questions. And so I get to ask like, what's going on here? Why did you take my biology? Why did you do that? And they explain that they are seeding star systems with our stuff. So I'm pretty certain, as I mentioned, that they're life preservers, that they actually are taking bio, human biology and then they're planting it on other star systems. And, uh, and that they're life creators, that they're actually part of their, the grand thing that they do is that they, they make life and they actually feel like they're servicing the kind of the God field, if you will, uh, because God, I, I get explained that um, uh, God likes, want, God desires to be born uh, yeah, that's it. basically God desires to to birth, to be born, and to be birthed into bodies, and so then they play a role in in kind of the quantum field, if you will, in birthing, having uh, bodies to put souls into. And um, I also get explained that they made the human body, and that's part of that process for them. And uh, so the hybrid thing is actually more of a 
nature process, if you will, as opposed to any kind of human concepts of governance or dominance. And um, they leave me out of traveling. They're the, they create the synchronicities that make me le find my spouse, my to-be spouse, uh, my wife, who will become my wife, that is. Uh, and so it has a rom my story is romance as well, too. It's a beautiful love story about how me and my wife found each other. And they were a part of it. They were there the night we met. They showed up as, a, as an object in the sky, and I recorded it. And it was put into my our, our marriage vows, or not my marriage vows, uh, in the marriage, the wedding we had. We had the story about how we got how we found each other and the, the the light I saw, the light we saw was a part of it. And now it turns out it was actually all part of a big plan and a big story wow. from the aliens perspective. And um, then I have uh, the 23rd, 4th, 5th and 6th all happen over like uh, 16 years as an adult. So they really, everything was condensed to traveling and as a young, as a young 20 year old. And then it's basically, uh, they keep they keep tying loose ends with information so in my 23rd contact event i hear uh that they put great alien hybrids on the planet a long time ago into the hundreds of thousands i get the vibration here that we're talking 130 or 140,000 years ago so very early pre-human history that there was great alien hybrids on here and that those dna is in the human population as we speak so i get told that oh. the 23rd contact event 24th i get told um how that there will be a planet event that will that will that will that will make the <clears throat> the next level that will um basically be how the hybrids get put on the planet that the planet event will occur it will shift the dimensional phase of the planet this stuff is just too much for people right now that will that will affect the those who have great alien dna and that they can utilize it people with great alien dna will be able to utilize the the, the consciousness field or the frequency field that will be, you know, electromagnetic field maybe is what it is that will be on the planet. And they're doing something where they're shifting something in the inside of the planet to do that. And then in the process, the hybrids get put down. And uh, that's the 24th contact event. The 25th is the, is the, is, <clears throat> is in 2016. And that's where she says, your memories are open, write a book and tell them we're coming and the hybrids will be there. So I, uh, I have several throughout the contact events. There's several. Um, I'm watching hybrids grow up, actually, and then the 25th is me seeing those hybrids I saw growing up are now part of the city. So they kind of they wanted to show me this kind of grand. This so I, I guess maybe I was bonded to it. Actually, I felt connected to it. And then the 26th, the last one, is actually me. It's uh, struggling with the memories being open, and I'm having. Uh, and it took me a long time to come to understanding what what had happened to me and uh, several years uh so th they actually said that memories were open by 2016 and i had no knowledge to look at aliens and so they just sat there in this discomfort feeling unresolved about something and i couldn't put it together and it took a long time to kind of put it all together and as i kind of talked about in the beginning of the, of the presentation so um it's a really big message right it's really big uh that's why there's like write the book thing going on here um and it's a story and it's emotional and uh and every contact event is, is exactly as i live it in the moment without understanding a single aspect of the big picture that they're showing me and i'm terrified at moments and i'm pissed at them at moments i'm yelling at them at moments and then i'm basically loving them at moments and and thinking that this is amazing and uh yeah so it's got the whole whole gauntlet of uh of of maybe what you might expect from something like this. So. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, when you look at the full picture, but as you said, during the process, it isn't clear to you that all these things line up. And at some point down the line, you're able to kind of uh, put, put the entire thing together, which, okay. So let me ask you this, as we talked about earlier, uh, potentially some of these things being, uh, experiences purely through the consciousness and then some of these things being physical out of the 26 do you feel they were all physical or mostly consciousness how do you what, what yeah. percentage would you give to those so i'm convinced all of mine are physical i'm convinced okay. every single one of them is physical i'm uh <clears throat> i know i know that there are some researchers out there saying that people can have astral body contact events and right. uh I don't, I don't doubt that that can happen. Um, but you know, I, I have biology taken. Um, in some cases I have to deal with clothing 
So I have to think about what I'm wearing and they actually get me to change clothes. Um, and in some cases I have scars, physical scars that occur afterwards. And uh, they were part of the, part of the memory, part of the whole history of me. Um, so, and also okay, the other twist to that too, is that all of the memories are like, <clears throat> these are memories. These memories contain frontal lobe experiences. They contain weather sensations. So they contain um, the adrenaline in the body. They contain the smells. So uh, like I see a dead cow at one point and they're, show they're, they're not telling me, but they're kind of referencing like, hey, cattle mutilations, that's us. And, mm. and, they're and I'm seeing a dead cow and I smell the cow as I walk by it. And, uh, and the cool environment, sometimes I mean, it's hot summer and I'm outside in nature and in the hot sun and then I go into the craft and it's cool. And so those, those striking differences are part of the memory sense. This is all frontal lobe stuff. This is not yeah. airy, dreamy, dream state stuff. This is frontal lobe processes. And, uh, and for me, it's all evidence that I have the biology and that I have scars and that I have, I have the chemical processes that make me feel like these are, these are somatic experiences that are in my body while they occur. And sometimes the craft has to land and then I walk into crafts. So there's like things like that going on here that for me are all proof. Again, the, the biggest one, though, is that it all happens in frontal lobe processes. The heat from the day is, in one case, the craft lands, and my ninth, con no, 11th contact event, the craft lands, the door stays open, and the entire contact event, the memory of it, is the hot, humid air is in the craft. Uh, and so it's just part of the memory set. Like, it's really, it, these aren't, I, I don't make sense to me as being astral. Though I don't doubt that, that can, something like that can happen. Um, I think here the aliens are showing that it just all ha can happen. So I think I think that's the bottom line. Is it's so overwhelming. All of it can happen, and all versions of it can happen. And they make the aliens make their choices based on what they need to what they need to be doing. So, yeah. Wow. So let me ask you this. So looking at Venus, uh, you know, it's covered with clouds. Obviously, we know that, and uh, we don't really we we have a I guess one of those probes we sent out was able to take a picture like, of the surface at one point in time yeah we so we know that it's earth-like up under all that um and 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 you know it, who's to say that that uh it's impossible for something to be living there um you know i don't think we have enough data to i know that we physically probably wouldn't be able to survive there but it doesn't mean that uh some other form of life would not you know be able to survive in those circumstances so yeah yeah, yeah well no it's it's very like i've been trying to do heavy research on this stuff so like i think the only indication i have here is you know missing 411 you know the missing 411 phenomenon oh yeah 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 so very fascinating and i and i went down the rabbit hole of trying to understand all that and by the way my own contact events happen out in nature and some of those locations are missing 411 locations it's really weird so there's like weird crossovers with my stuff and uh but the some of the concepts, some of the missing four in one cases, they seem to be cryptoids that take children. Yet the children will be taken into some kind of dimension or something with which no one can see them, but they're there. And the environment is a bit different. So in one case of the child said so the son was there the entire time and she was with a bear person or a dog or a, de a bear man or a wolf man or something. And then it, and, it, the, and they she was hearing the the search and rescue and the, she they walked by her yet the search and rescue had done this really intense you know search and we have cases like that where it's like this is my my best hypothesis is that the aliens are operating in the ghost realm and the if that's is that the astral realm i don't know is it I, I just think of it as the ghost realm and i know that because um i've experienced paranormal activity from the gray alien in my present life like presently like within the last you know, several years, I can have repeated paranormal experiences around this content, and I know it's them. And I know other contactees where that's the case. And a lot of contactees become mediums. So uh, we end up with the mediumship abilities because the entities are interact. That's the kind of their environment. Mm -hmm. So what happens when a human in a biological form goes there in that in that dimensional space? Like we, we have these ideas that's all ghost, but what if you take the biology and then the human body and then put it in that dimension? then what happens are you able to do, do, are you even affected by the physical environment anymore and so that's the kind of thing i lean towards here is that we're actually dealing with you know the ghost realm on venus 
is where that city is. And so when you're out in the environment, you can see it, but you're not feeling it. You're not feeling the seven kilometers under the ocean type pressure. You're right. not experiencing any of the gas, carbon dioxide gas. You're not experiencing the uh, 400 degrees heat or whatever the heat is. Uh, so you're not, you're not affected by it. And the city is out in the open and everything's out in the open and it's not affected by the environment. So, and there is something going on here where we're kind of convinced through some of the researchers, it looks like the, the craft are sitting here now. They could be, you know, phased in these dimensional ways in a paranormal realm as they're in, a, in our own environments here uh, on earth. And uh, so that's where I lean towards this because it's the only thing I can understand uh, that could make some sense about how I was out on Venus in that environment. Yeah. And that's good. That's actually good to think that through because yeah, that, that would make sense. Yeah. If you were able to, if you were drawn into this, uh, separate realm and I, we all know these realms exist because I have pictures of shadow people myself right. and, uh, I've had e not ET experiences, but I've had experiences with craft. So we know for a fact, something is controlling the craft. So, with that being said, that that sounds uh, plausible. That, yeah, if you step into this other realm where it's not the physical realm we're in now, uh, that some of those things would definitely be plausible. And until and my whole thing is is that, and I've said this a thousand times, and I stand on it, is that if we we don't understand even the reality that we live in, so who's who's to say what? is going on outside of this reality that that we uh the societal reality that we live in we have an infinite space out there we have the fact we had 60 foot lizards walking on this planet i mean there's so right. many things that you could put out there that we know are fact uh to to pretty much uh, make you understand that what you think you know, you probably don't really know. And yeah. uh, we just don't understand everything. So it's good to talk this stuff through because obviously, you know, you tell your your truth and your story, then you're going to have obviously some skeptics out there that want to question this or want to question that. But I think if you just take it back to the fact that we don't understand what it is that we live in, if you just start there, yeah. then that kind of leaves pretty much everything else open uh to possibility and i just that's what the thing that i don't get and that's the thing i try to tell everyone else is that there isn't anything we could point to with finality and say that this is what this is because scientists change the books every 20 or so years on what it is that they perceive as uh reality and it's just something that ever is ever evolving and we'll in our lifetimes, we may never get to a point to where we truly understand what is possible and what isn't. So yeah. kind of just starting there. Well, we're in the matrix. Like this is a simulation. Like the, the, the math is all adding up. The experiments all add up. This is a simulation. So y y that means we don't understand the nature of reality. And, it, and it's, it's, you know, and also, you know, doctors are now finding proof for near death experiences and, and past life researchers are finding proof of past life awareness. So like that we definitely don't understand the nature of reality and we have nothing all we've been relying on are religious texts uh and scriptures to understand you know a whole other dimensional truth about us that we have no real understanding about so yeah it sounds like we might just be only aware of a fragment of what reality actually is and uh and so this idea of something highly highly and highly intelligent been living for millions of years uh has mastered it actually as uh it seems very real. It just seems very possible and real. And I, and it's, and you're right about that. I think part of the argument I like to take with people is like, this is what you should expect <laughs> from a million year old spacefaring species. You should, you should be expecting something that is just out of this. Like you could not f find the Neanderthal S and, and show them this world and have them be like, Oh, this is exactly what I thought it would look like, exactly. you know, because they would have no ability to comprehend it. It's literally outside of the realm of comprehension. So the same thing is going on here where we assume the aliens act like us, behave like us, think like us. And uh, that's why they're probably just dark because they're nefarious because they're just abducting people. We don't understand these things, but you know, the idea that we're just dealing with something that has got, what we're dealing with might be a bag that is so massive that we aren't even willing to understand how deep it goes. Um, that that's that that might be the single answer about about 
you know, what, how we have to handle this, this uh, new uh, phenomenon that's coming upon humanity. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. And I think the key to it, I think the key to it all is, is really when approaching this and trying to decipher the information from different experiencers is just to keep your mind open. Just keep yeah. your mind open because we can talk through the stuff and we you leave it on the table, you leave it on the board, and over time you may find things that correlate with exactly with, with someone else's uh, experience. And that way you can kind of put the picture together, but you should never throw away the data. The data should always be accepted, but have an open mind approach to it. And I've, I've even theorized on these ETs, I, I've theorized that we may find out that they don't even know everything. We may, right. we may get to the table with these ETs and, and obviously they're going to bring us up to speed on a lot of the things that we don't know. And once we find ourselves uh, knowledge wise, neck and neck, we're going to find out that they're actually still searching for answers out here because it's just no one. I don't think there's probably anything out there that has it a hundred percent completely figured out. And so yeah. this is a journey for all of us uh, to go on. So with that being said, uh, you, you mentioned um, you had an experience in 2019 with the orbs. Mm -hmm. And so what is your idea of, I uh, know I'm with the theory that, that, that they may represent the energies uh, some sort of energy, whether it's, I don't know, extraterrestrial, whatever it represents, but it's obvious it's some sort of energy. The sighting that I had was uh, I had like these 47 physical sphere like objects that that, you know, when you whenever you see daytime sightings, you see these white spheres like the ones that I videotape. But then at night and, and they, they do things like they have V formations and they're kind of they're always in some sort of formation. Then when you look at nighttime sightings, what I've realized is that a lot of the things that we see at night, like the Phoenix Lights, like uh, a lot of the other famous sightings uh, from that show orbs. I'm under the belief that these physical things that we see in the daytime potentially are orbs at night or they have an inner glow or they're able to, you know, so I, I don't know where I fall on, you know, exactly what these orbs are. And I'm just theorizing, but with your experience with these orbs, how would you describe them as physical things that glow or just simply balls of energy or how would you look at those? Yeah. Great question. Uh, if I just may ask the ones that you, you said you took a picture or you filmed, uh, yeah. Video. Did they look like metal. Did they look like they were reflective, like metal? They were definitely reflective. They shined in the sun and, yeah. uh, they were definitely metallic. They yeah. were white right. and they had these, uh, little black, I want I want to say almost like pipe things sticking out the bottom of them and there were like 47 of them in a formation and they were doing this and that and I have them clear blue sky no clouds and these things brilliant. all disappeared in a thin air at one time brilliant brilliant um yeah I, I love that kind of stuff so um uh from my experience uh they it is all in, of the above and again it's all the choice of the alien because uh, there are orbs that are just the energy form, a hundred percent. The things that I filmed that are on my website, I'm I would say I'm probably ninety percent certain those are crafts. And I have a couple deductions about how I put that together. Um, first off, I actually see one of these objects in my, my eighth contact event, the uh, the Venus going to Venus. It was always throughout my entire history. I saw a red orb actually. And, uh, and I didn't know what it was. I thought it was a flare because I was a young teenager and I didn't really understand these things. And it just sat there and it also kind of arose in the sky in a really strange way. And then it just sat there and, and it wouldn't go away. And then when it left, it kind of fell into the, into the, into the forest. And I kind of felt like something, like I was kind of weirded out. I was like, what's going on? And there's something there. I couldn't figure it out, went to bed and I didn't know I had a contact event, but I did. And, uh, and, but what the memory exposed was they had taken that thing and put it onto a beach where I was tenting and it was a 20 foot tall craft. And, and then I would go inside of it. It was a spherical metallic looking. Then uh, when my memories hadn't come out yet, 
but I started having a lot of paranormal and sightings activity. The first thing I have was me and my spouse witnessing a metallic spherical object. So we saw it f uh, go over our sky. And at first I thought, well, this is a satellite because it's, but why is it a satellite during the day? I couldn't figure it out. Got the binoculars and I could see it was a sphere and it had, it had metal, like you can almost see the paneling, like a metal panels around it, but it had a red flare underneath it. So uh, like the gravity, if, like now from like kind of Bob Lazar and Lou Elizondo, I'm like very pretty convinced that that's the, that was the gravity generator. And then it's interacting, it's ionizing with the atmosphere. So it's turning red. And uh, and then it, it dropped and I was able to grab a picture, but I didn't have a good camera at the time. And so it's just a blur. And uh, But we were able to kind of see it through binoculars. Then the sighting I have that's on my website, um, I have a, a video on my YouTube channel where I kind of tear apart, you know, uh, Lou Elizondo, by the way, corroborates Bob Lazar for all the Bob Lazar doubters out there. Um, and so I, I really, you know, this guy has some physics that aren't matching up that he was talking about in the 80s and uh, the late in late 90s. That now is like we're getting these kind of whistleblowers matching his information. I think this guy was pretty accurate. And he describes Bob Lazar describes these generators ionizing the atmosphere. And that's exactly what you see with my videos. You see these effect it's having with the atmosphere. And, uh, and that's, I lean towards that as an actual craft. Um, and I have not just my videos, I've done uh, deep dive researcher research here with the databases, the Vancouver databases or the BC databases, and other people have filmed those red objects uh, themselves. And so I took they, those videos as well too. And they're always, you're looking at something that's massive. You're looking at something that's definitely a 20 foot tall, possibly 30 foot tall object. Um, this can't be an orb, like a small little energy plasma orb. This thing is a massive object, especially the ones I filmed. They're far, their distance is quite far. So um, I'm definitely looking at an object. And then, yeah, but it has this weird added element where it disappears in front of you. So I'm watching, I'm watching, and then just starts slowly fading and then it's gone. And all the videos I have are like that, where all these orb things, but I, I do think they're crafts and then they're phasing. I, I can only assume they're phasing. I don't really know what's going on there. Um, so I think we're, I think it's multiple things. I think we, we really want to pigeonhole this stuff, but I'm really certain that it's all of the above actually. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, cause I actually, and, and I've done some frame by frame work on my video and, in one of the frames, I caught this, uh, it's a zigzag line in the sky. And it was, uh, I've seen this on other people's videos before. And it, uh, it, it, where this was in the sky, first of all, one frame, it's right here. The next frame, it's moved up here. And it's ahead of all these objects. I mean, in it's perfect conditions, clear blue sky. The sun is at noon, at high noon. And it, it was just the perfect moment to capture something and i see this little thing which i think and i can't say for sure but in the same part of the sky this was was spotted in is where those things disappeared so um you know i'm under the feeling that those things were probes of some like uh extraterrestrial uh, extraterrestrial drones or something of that nature the things probably weren't manned but they definitely weren't from here and they uh, they almost seemed like they were alive. And I actually put it together with a video where I found other instances. There was uh, back in Mexico, maybe 15 years ago. And, and different, actually, they had like three or four different instances where there were like hundreds of these things in the sky. In the middle of the day in Mexico, you may have seen the video where these white objects are just floating across the sky. And I went ahead and put this, I lined it up with mines. They're the exact same objects. Right. And, and I put together a video where I've seen these different times where these things have been spotted different times, cataloged with MUFON. And, and the thing with that is, is that that's kind of where, you know, it. so I can almost prove, I won't say prove because not, nothing's 100%, but I can say that these objects have been spotted other times. I yeah. can tell you what the characteristics are. And so when it comes down to building a database uh, for us to be able to access and kind of reference things off of, I can tell you for sure there are these white objects that are spheres that are physical in the sky. For whatever reason, uh, they I don't know what they're doing, but I can tell you that when I initially saw these things, my girlfriend brought it to my attention and they were in this ball. They were in a ball and they were like, 
flying like this amongst each other. And I, it didn't, at first I'm thinking, these are birds. And, and my girlfriend, she's like, no, they're not birds. You can see them shining in, off the sun. So I'm looking at them for a minute and I'm like, okay, yeah, that is weird. So I get my camera, I come back out. By the time I come out, they're flying right overhead. So I can see them with my naked eye and I can see exactly what they are. They're not anything that I've ever seen on this planet. Yeah. And and these things just disappeared uh, in the thin in the thin blue air now with with that being said there was a sighting um a video that was put out by someone it was called the longbow 281 uh video where these border patrol agents captured on their camera these things that were doing the same thing and going across the sky and people wrote those off as birds and said there was nothing to it so my frustration has been that within our community within ufology even experiencers of other events look at things and then write them off immediately as being something that's mundane and these are actual good sightings that people are just simply throwing away yeah and i think that's a big problem that we have within this field and why i believe everything needs to be accepted and cataloged regardless how you feel about it because later on down the line we can either check it off the list or we can say yeah that was some there was something to that yeah and it's it's just kind of one of the things one that, that kind of gets to me when i see people who should be on board with this kind of writing things off without even thinking or running any data past this yeah i don't know yeah. how you feel about that oh it's um <clears throat> listen i upon having my sightings and having and being able to record them there's no one to give them to and uh, and when I've passed them off to someone I thought was a researcher, they don't. Yeah, they shut it down. Oh, the, the, I, the, those ones I have on my website, which are, you know, I back this up. I, the same thing you've done. You find others that match it that are definitely acting, you know, non like like nothing else we have on planet Earth. And so it's obviously something very bizarre and it all matches a pattern. And yet the guy who I gave it to said, oh, well, there's probably a glare going on with your you know your mirror and he was a ufo researcher himself not just that he was sitting on other i eventually went to his database and it found he had similar videos yet he's the one who tossed mine aside and i'm not really clear if they are concerned for egos so then i start saying oh you know this researcher validated it and then they feel like like I don't, maybe something like that happens you're totally right i actually just again had someone from mufon actually not uh, get upset with me that i say things like this in public um, and, uh, and I'm like, well, how about, you know, stop writing things off because you're totally right about that. And I, I use Reddit. That's the only thing I can go to. And even Reddit is, has lots of skeptics, but at least it gets posted. At least it's there for the public. It's part of my own, uh, you know, my own data, my own, my own information. That's the only thing I can do with it because MUFON doesn't seem, I actually, so I, I upset someone cause I said MUFON doesn't care. And because when I gave things to MUFON, they don't do anything. And I've never known anyone to get an investigation from them either. And it doesn't, you know, I, I'm not trying to be hard on them. I'm certain they're dealing with the same things that everyone is, you know, there's too much maybe of, you know, light reflecting off a camera and someone calls that an UFO. So there might be a bunch of that as well too. And I can feel for that and I can agree with that. But we, I agree, man, we do not have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of places to go when you have a sighting and a legitimate sighting. And especially someone like me or someone like you who's doing the hard research, you're trying to figure out what did I see here and you want that to be validated because it not just that, it changed you, right? That that sighting affected yeah. you. That a sighting, you saw something you never saw before, you need to get validation for it. And you don't have an out for it. And that's that is that's you're right. That's you're accurate about that. And I I'm 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 with you actually. <laughs> and uh this is a very challenging world, and I really think the other side to what's going on here is that they don't want a lot of researchers still want it to be objective and not subjective. And there's a lot of things going on when the UFO gets sighted, it becomes a subjective experience for them. I saw it, but my friend didn't see it kind of thing, or I saw it and it talked to me <laughs> or I saw it. I said something and it responded all subjective experience. And there's a lot of researchers who don't want it to go there. They want it to be objective. It's just a sighting you had that was random. And, and I don't want to hear how it had other cool, other meaning making events tied to it. But you know, this is, as I said, it's all consciousness. So it, it is subjective. And, uh, and that means it's subjective first before it's objective. So uh, yeah, we have to change the way we think about this information. 
Yeah, and um, you brought up MUFON, and that was, uh, uh, you know, I did a video on my own channel, and it was titled, uh, Did MUFON Drop the Ball? And, and I had a feeling about MUFON at that time I made the video, because the representative that I was dealing with, it was apparent that this representative uh, was not doing his due diligence in trying to figure out what this was. Uh, I gave this this person valuable data and, and things that I had already went and checked and did. And I gave examples of other times where this happened within their own MUFON database. I'm talking about a MUFON database where someone else has looked at these same things and the yeah. result for them was unknown. However, the person I was dealing with came back and tried to say something like party balloons. Okay. So it showed me, it showed me right away that they didn't even look in their own database to try to figure out if these things have been seen before. Yeah. But then I recently interviewed, uh, uh, Margie K and Debbie Ziegelmeyer, who are directors of MUFON in Illinois, another state I'm in California, Southern California. So the person I was dealing with was for this region. And they told me, Debbie and Margie told me that there was a time when I, right around the time I reported this, which is about a year ago, where uh, things probably weren't being handled, cases weren't being handled in the best way. And they admitted that to me. So it just let me know that there are subsets of uh, regions where they may not actually be following up on these things and you in and trying to really get the results that it that we're looking for so they agreed uh that i could send them the data and they would go ahead and have it looked into which is really what what should be done but i had the same feeling that you uh, had with mufon i made a video about it and i showed just different examples on why this person was incorrect i even emailed the representative back and gave him another chance and said hey i know this is what you came with but i need you to take another look at this never responded but uh what we're going to do real quick is we're at the the bottom of our second hour and jeff has graciously agreed to stick around for about 30 more minutes so you guys yeah. get your questions ready and i do uh have a couple already marked here but we're going to go ahead and take another pause for the cause as we get ready to uh jump into this break and come back with our number three of space out radio after hours we will see you guys in a minute
guys welcome back to space style radio after hour number three with me your host mr rob g and our guest here today jeff selver uh we've been talking about a lot of stuff if you missed it definitely go back and do the rewatch uh as we jump into hour number three uh jeff has agreed to stay around for a little bit here so we're gonna go ahead and jump into some audience questions real quick i know we had a couple here and uh let me start here brandon coast was asking uh, as far as Venus goes, are they actually at our Venus in this layer of reality or are they at Venus in their layer of reality? Yeah. So, yeah, I guess we discussed this earlier, right? Um, and I, uh, our, I, 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 I can't quite frame that wording. I think, I, I think the best way I just can only frame it is the paranormal realm. So I, is it, cause that could still be our layer of reality. Um, just a, just an, just a thinner dimension sitting on top of the dimension we live in. And, uh, and so we might actually be affecting it, that dimension. And there might be some more, uh, reciprocal connection than we are willing to understand, which is actually partially what I think is going on with the aliens. We're, we're disturbing dimensions and we don't know it. Um, so I, I, the word layer of reality, I think I, I would, for me, I can only frame it as, uh, th that paranormal realm that sits uh, with, that interacts with the realm we're in. And yes, I actually, we talked about this. I'm convinced myself that they're on a paranormal, that ghost level ghost realm in the, on Venus. Uh, that's what I think is going on. But th you know, again, they don't explain these things to me. Um, so, but that's the only, only thing that for me that can make sense. Agreed. Agreed. Um, Cosmic Joe Chronicles asked, uh, Jeff, why can't I remember my abduction experiences and you can? Yeah, that's a hard one, eh? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think the quest, the answer to that question, at least. I mean, again, I can only speculate, but I'm pretty certain the aliens are in control of the entire thing, and um, when they want you to know you'll know. And when they don't want you to know, uh, you don't know. And I, I'm also aware of several contactees personally in my life, um, who definitely have alien contact and they can't get the memories. They go to hypnotic regressionists and everything and they can't get it. And, uh, 
yeah, there's something going on there where they wanted that, and that's what twenty six the the twenty fifth contact event in twenty sixteen um, is them saying your memories are open now. So they were yeah they kind of like alluded that they're in control of the entire thing. And now you have access to them. They also knew that I needed to heal from it. So what happened to me was pretty extreme. Never not saying that what you know, the biological stuff or anybody's contact events can be extreme. But you know, I was kind of an experiment for them. And what happened to me altered my life pretty intensely. Uh, that they had done with me had altered my life intensely. So there was a, a resolution required actually. And they do uh, they do say that they kind of allude to that that you're in pain. And you need to heal and so we need to open up these memories so they're very aware of those kind of uh yeah they're just very aware and i'm not clear also that when disclosure all comes out and all is said and done that you don't get those memories like I'm, i kind of convinced you do um again i don't have any information for that but i just i think the idea is is that a lot more people than you know have had alien contact and uh and you'll be people who are just totally in denial and don't even know they have alien contact have had alien contact. And I think all that helps the aliens. I think that when time is ready, that those memories are there for them to open up. Cause if they're able to do that with me, then they're definitely able to do that with, you know, maybe the entire human population. I'm not saying I know that that's going to happen, but I just, I feel for you because of how it can affect a person's life. And I want to provide you hope that you will know at some point um, <clears throat> whether it's within the body or not. I mean, I mean to say you passed on because it's been so long, but I'm pretty certain disclosure is happening. I'm convinced of it. And I'm certain part of that is to how the aliens have interacted with humans is a part of that picture as well, too. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And, and I'll add to that. Um, OK. Question being, why can't I remember my abduction experiences and you can't? So it, here's what I'll say. How can you, how do you know that you that you aren't remembering abduction experiences? Maybe you haven't had one or to add to that, maybe you have, and you just aren't aware of it. And, and the reason why I even say that is because, you know, there are some people out there who haven't had any experiences at all. And they're watching this show tonight They've never seen a craft. They've never uh, had a paranormal experience. They know these things are plausible and real based on others' testimony, but then themselves haven't had an experience. I have personally had a craft experience. I've had a shadow, and this I've shown this on this show, physical receipts of craft and of shadow people. So knowing that that's an open uh, uh, a, a thing that's that's that I've shown you is plausible and likely real. I have not had an extraterrestrial encounter that I'm aware of. However, I've mentioned on the show as well that I have this scar right here on my wrist. This is about this long. And uh, I've seen this scar for maybe the last 20 years of my life, maybe longer. And I could never figure out when it happened. It was always puzzled me. And not until recently, until I've had these, these brought these receipts to the table, did it make me feel like potentially I've had some sort of, maybe I did have a contact at some point and I just can't recall it, which is what's going to set me up to do a regression for this year. That's my goal by the end of this year, because I may uncover and I've talked to other people like Deb Shakti. I had Susie Hansen, who you're familiar with and others on the show that uh, I've asked the question it, it, with the percentage of people that are out here on this planet. Is it likely that a lot of people, most people have had an experience and just <clears throat> can't recall it? And the answer has always been yes. And I think that makes sense. And maybe it's because the e like you're saying, the ETs have blocked this out uh, of your current memory. And it's something you have to dig up and regress to get the answer to. But I, I would say, uh, Cosmic Joe Chronicles, maybe it's as simple as you would do going through a regression therapy to find out those answers, uh, the answer to your question here. Um, and just because you can't recall, it doesn't mean it didn't happen, first of all. And, uh, you, I think there's just other steps you may have to go through to unlock that within yourself. So, um, that would be my answer. And the next question we had was, uh, from John Condor. 
He was asking, uh, Jeff, when was your most recent close encounter? Hmm. Hey, John. Um, my most recent close encounter. So are we talking, you know, are we talking craft or are we talking contact physical event? So my 2017 is the last physical contact event I had. <clears throat> and uh, that's laid out in the book. I haven't interacted with the, the entities in physical form since that time. But they're here. They're still here. And they're here now. And uh, um, they're so, okay, I found it very interesting that you think you might have had alien contact. Everybody I know, so face to face would be 2017. So that's the last physical face to face contact event I had. Okay. Yeah. But so I'll tell you this other part. Um, so they're very aware of, of, Everyone I know who's doing something public with the with all this has had contact, right? They all know, and if they don't know it, they're they're having some kind of you know CE five style where they're having dreams. They wake up, they get out the door, and there's an orb there, and they're like, "I was just dreaming about aliens, and now there's this orb outside my window. What's going on?" And that person ends up starting something, and I'm finding a lot of that kind of connection where the aliens themselves are very aware of the of the public aspect of of us talking how we're affecting humanity, what we're saying, what we're doing. And uh, again, there's several researchers that think that the aliens are the ones in control of the entire public process. And I would agree with that. I'm pretty certain that's the case. And they're very aware of me. And so every time I'm public, every time I do a presentation, I kind of do these presentations at UFO groups, they show up the night before and they show up the night after. And so I just did one uh, last weekend and that night, they were outside my window and uh, and it's a spherical orb it's like a it's like a craft is what it looks like it looks like a craft but it's white and it's sphere and it knows i anyway it's a personal event but it's, i'm not able to film them they're quick enough that they i can't grab my phone and film it and i uh, filmed a couple of them but the ones that i have that are filmed that those are the ones they want me to be filming obviously uh but so they're very aware and then that's a that's a connection and i can feel them actually in that moment too so i have a kind of a, a moment of kind of connection so that's the that last that was the last time i had an interaction with them where for me it was definitively kind of a communication or an awareness going on uh but very fascinating and it's always around being public it's always around doing something public it's always around talking about the contact events it's always around uh talking about them in fact sometimes i'll talk about them in a presentation and then they i'll say something about what i've experienced with them and they'll do it as an orb or as a craft outside the, ne the next night or the night that night where i'm kind of musing that i talked about them and i see them out in the sky and they'll do what i was talking about so they're very aware of even you know the conversations i'm having and so uh I find that all very fascinating because then that means they're they're kind of in charge of this process and they're very aware of it. Yeah. All right. All right. And I'll say I'll add this as well. Uh, uh, let me see. Thank you, Derek. I appreciate headgear is exquisite. I appreciate you. Um, I, the cause and effect part of this phenomena, um, it may be just a coincidence, and I brought this up, uh, but prior to my sighting, I hadn't had any, and in, in my sighting, to put it, frame it, is uh, August of 2022, so we're talking less than two years ago, I had my first yeah. sighting ever in my life, then after that is when I had the uh, shadow person experience, both of them documented, but the one thing, and I can't say that this uh set me up to have the sighting but i was doing a, uh, another show i was a co-host on a different show prior to my sighting and we had a guest who was called himself a reptilian channeler and he was speaking so matter of fact of what he had the ability to do and he's talking to these other species and he asked me during the show uh would i be open to having contact with uh one of these species and i told him i said yeah i would definitely be open to that at any time you know just set it up let me know and i swear within seven days of that conversation is when i had uh, my sighting i don't know if the two things are related <laughs> right. but it could be one of those yeah. cause and effect things yeah. where maybe he with the ability that he has set me up to have my sighting but coincidentally or not it happened within seven days yeah. Uh, of that conversation synchronicity right yeah that's uh that's exactly what happens with me it's 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 
that's why it's subjective. It's not objective. And it, listen, the crafts are alive. They're 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 operating on this quantum God field, the soul field, whatever. They're able to utilize it. I've experienced it for myself. A person can merge with that thing, and you can experience you know enlightenment or God or attainment or whatever you might want to call it. And they're able to. That's the the realm they're living in. So then some of this starts to making sense if you're actually synchronicities are real visioning is real these kind of abilities that the, the, the realities of the, you know the earth or the world around us is a hologram and then there's a consciousness device and it has a personal interaction with the person so i'm i'm having a uh, my, my video the last youtube video of a uh, uf of the uap um i'm thinking about the aliens and i would explain this in the video that i had a kind of a weird event happen in the morning I had a tarot reading. I don't normally do, normally do tarot readings, and uh, but I was looking for some kind of guidance. And listen, I anyway, I find them statistically significant these tarot readings. And uh, and when I I was review I was reviewing it like hours later, I was staring at my iPhone because I took a picture of the reading, and I was thinking, you know, this is like they're guiding my alien content because I have the books out and I have a couple of presentations and things I'm doing, and it felt like it was guidance because it seemed very relevant to the the, the cards were very relevant. To what was going on in my life regarding the alien content as i'm thinking that i look up from my iphone and there's a goddamn uap and i'm like what the hell and so i grab my my thing and i film it and i make that part of the video as a part of like you know like jack valet has this in his research right that there's a telepathic aspect to the phenomenon so I could, I, I'm not really clear what's going on. Am I the one who's thinking about them and then they they come in at that time or am I tuning in to them in my atmosphere or my world and then uh, and then I start thinking about them and now I see the craft. There's something going on here. There's some kind of synchronicity. There's some kind of level of personal involvement, personal subjective involvement uh, that defies our human understanding right now. And, uh, and a lot of people, this is what's normal, is that it's a subjective experience for people. Um, they often get very affected, too, when people have UAP experiences. So, yeah, that's a, that's an awesome and amazing twist to your story. I love it. Yeah. Definitely. And Deb from SAC, uh, thanks for the awesome super chat. Thanks for your support, Deb from SAC. You know, it's all love. We love you. Uh, Deb asks, do you look forward to these encounters or do they frighten you? Um, so... I, uh, so I, again, not having physical counters since the physical counters encounters, um, they don't frighten me, but they're intense. <laughs> so I am, I have a, a part of me that's like, whoa, the idea of that, the idea of, of, uh, of, even though I have had 26, I'm still like, whoa, that that's, that's intense. Um, and you actually only sometimes feel good when you're in the craft because the craft has this kind of different environment feel going on, like electromagnetic environment that just makes you feel really good but if you don't you're not in the environment yet and you're interacting with one of these entities it's actually really shocking even for me i'm like whoa my human brain is you know I, i'm aware of them i can interact with them but i'm still kind of put off until i'm in the comfort mode of well yeah this is what it's like um other than that the kind of more orb stuff i absolutely love it i i love this stuff i love I love that they're that I saw them last week. I love it. I, I actually I feel really I feel amazing. I see them, and I feel that connection I have. I talk about in the book where I kind of am energized by them. Uh, I feel that when I see the orbs, and I know it's them. And uh, so yeah, it's kind of a weird game of of knowing it's intense. It's intense for my human body actually. It's intense for my mind to interact with these entities, and then so I, a little bit of like kind of a shock, if you will. Uh, but there's a lot of joy when I see these objects and the idea that somehow I'll be able to interact with this stuff again. It sounds like I've drank the Kool-Aid and I have to admit, I probably have, but I think this stuff is like when you get there and you you start interacting with their tech, you kind of get that this is, this is um, a level of spiritual joy and the aliens themselves are so removed from our world. They have no emotional output. They're already in it. And it's, and, and I think when I say that people assume that means they talk like they must be like angels then but they're not right they're kind of these very removed dimensional entities and yet they live in this very completed state that's very ecstasy and then they don't have any emotional expression at all and uh, at least that's the case with my entity this thing was having merged with the tech um it is it is a it is an enlight it is a joy state it is a high pure ecstasy state and um so yeah i get kind of excited at the ideas of connecting with that again so 
Yeah, and 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 just for I'm just chiming on that. If I ever and, and here's the thing from I'm at that point where because I haven't had uh, an actual interaction with an ET, I feel like uh, that's prob that that has to be like the next thing to happen for me, and it just it it actually frightens me though because I hear stories of uh, in, in most cases uh with abductions that these things are here to help and there's there's always like you've said a good feeling when you're actually amongst them uh and and but the kind of way i look at it as is especially with their ability to to re-abduct the same people or interact with the same people over and over i kind of look at it like uh when we tag a, a well in the ocean, right? And we can see where it's at anywhere in the world. We can go, if we need to go revisit that particular well, we can do so. We can track it and we can go to where it's at and we can, and we can, so it's, it's kind of like the experience that people say they have with these grays. But then at the same time, we have out there in the ocean poachers, right? Which you could run up on a poacher and it's not going to be the same experience. It's going to be something totally drastically different. And I feel like uh, there potentially are the equivalent of those poacher ETs that are out there that, that you come up on happenstance and the experience isn't so great. But the ones that can tag you and continue to to locate you wherever you may be, those are the ones that are just uh, doing this stuff, you know, to uh, better your situation, uh, essentially. And and I think that I think that could apply to the experiences that people are having with ETs. But it just it frightens me personally because these things don't look like humans. And just to imagine being face to face with something that is so drastically different than what you are is the part that frightens me, even though I'll have people to say you shouldn't be afraid. But that's just kind of how I how I fall with that. Well, so just wanted to say that. I No, I, and I agree with you. And, and, and like humans are not accustomed to an entity having this much power. Uh, they bend space, bend time. They have the mental abilities are out of this world. They, uh, and even being frozen by one, my first contact event, I'm frozen trying to run away. And it's just terror. It's the, listen, I, I, I know the feeling of a bird. You know how the bird flies into your home and gets caught and can't get out. And you're the one who has to go and grab that bird. And then it might start, you know, pooping when you grab it. Cause it's just sitting there terrified. And that feeling of that bird, I know that feeling. Cause that's the feeling of it knowing that human is, you know, 30 times more intelligent than I am with a high degree of intelligence and it can kill me right now. I have to surrender to it. Yes. That's the feeling of being in front of a gray alien. <laughs> and you have to have that relationship to know not to be scared. And if you don't, it is, it is intimidating amount of power they have. And yeah, it's just intimidating amount of power. And again, it's a really interesting contrast that they have so much power and then they're kind of operating on the God field or the unified field or whatever. And so it's weird. It makes sense that, yeah, when you are that pure or you go move, you move, you're, you're operating on this higher level that you end up having so much more power that you actually don't abuse it. But you, as a human, it is, we are not accustomed to that. We are not accustomed to anything like that. And anything yeah, being be above us. Terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Okay, great. And we have uh, a couple more questions. We had Sunstar Tequila, who's asking, uh, what was the message the aliens left for you or humanity? Yeah. So um, it okay, embraces the back of my book. Uh, there's a whole story behind it, actually, uh, between me and Susie Hansen. Um, I won't go into the story. Yeah, it'll be on my YouTube channel. Um, but I'll tell you the message. <clears throat> and this was from uh, the elder... And, and the leader, the kind of mantis entity. It's not to dominate you. It's to change to societal structures that benefit you. And to change to societal structures that benefit nature. There are very, there are ways that are very advanced for a society to coexist. But they are reorientations of your sense of self. Because they involve consciousness technology. Spirit technology, maybe that's, I heard someone say, what's consciousness technology? Spirit tech, tech, tech that interacts with your soul. Let's put it that way. And, uh, and we don't even know what that means. The word is just goes over people's heads. Right. Um, but this is about the hybrids, right? And so it's not to dominate you. It's the kind of 
the emphasis. They're coming, and it's not to dominate you. Uh, they, they, uh, the way it's kind of framed in several different interactions uh, that I've had with them, that they're stewards of the planet. There's a management role going on here, and uh, something is going on here with their managers. And and it's kind of if you frame it like that, they're they're putting hybrids on. It's not don't be scared. It's not to dominate you, but they're needed because you need to kind of curb your your direction, and uh, and that helps with that process with the human. So it's kind of more like that, and that seems to be the ultimate message of the book. Awesome, awesome. And then we have Joe Monk asking: Is it possible that listening to shows like this, where people talk about abductions, opens us up to being abducted? If that's part of your plan, I, I don't. Uh, I don't quite believe that someone who just the aliens. I mean, she once told me in a telepathic communication, everything we do has has a purpose. So they're not. I don't really know them to be just willy nilly trying to take people and and. Uh, I mean, I just really can't speak for everything right now. I'm off, obviously talking subjectively, but. Uh, I don't really know. Like, I don't believe that that can happen. Um, that someone's, but, but remember with me, I was 16 years old and I got excited reading about Whitley Strieber's abduction that I wanted to be abducted and that it happened. But I don't look at that event like, Oh my God, I shouldn't have wished that because now they, this changed my life. And I don't, I think of it as my consciousness, my heart, my soul from the afterlife and from the previous uh, contact events I already had as a child was actually saying was what that was the part of me that was excited oh my god i can't wait for this to happen again and i wasn't i didn't have any way of framing it so i just read a book and was really excited by it and that yes <laughs> yes i believe that that can happen to someone i believe that all of this all the books we have that are out now and all the videos that people can watch on this content yeah you got it and i believe that if you have something in you it can jostle that and that's why we're talking that's why i'm supposed to be talking that's why contactees are supposed to be talking. So we shake it in other people. Every person you see, Whitley Strieber, he talks about Bud Hawkins, a Bud Hawkins book that jostled it for him, right? It's every, it's kind of a pattern that's just kind of moving downwards of everyone's experiences are kind of opening up everyone else's experiences. So yeah, definitely something like that can happen. Um, but I don't want to terrify people because I'm not convinced there's no willy nilly thing here going on where you can just randomly get picked up because you read about it or heard about it. Um, it has to be part of your path, you know, and I think that someone might feel that. That's the point. Yeah, and I'll add to that. I think it uh, goes back to what we talked about in the beginning here, which uh, has to do with enlightenment. So it, it, is it possible listening to shows like this where people talk about abductions opens opens us up to being abducted? Potentially, uh, if you've been enlightened, if you've been unlocked on that level, then potentially it does. Maybe that's the key. Maybe as we get enlightened, like you said earlier, it allows us to have these conscious experiences with these ETs. So whether that's an abduction or whether that's just some sort of interaction, uh, it could be as simple as listening to the right person tell the right story that unlocks that for you. So uh, I, I, I could see how that would be a plausible thing. Um, and yeah, so I would just say continue being open minded to the possibility. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe one of these things, one of these stories that you hear unlocks that thing within you for you. And then you have that experience. Like I said, I, when I explained with the reptilian channeler that I spoke to and then seven days and I'm not tying the two things together saying it was because of that. But I'll tell you that throughout my life. All the years I lived prior, I hadn't had anything happen. And then the person asked me if I would be open to having an experience with one of these extraterrestrials. And I told that person, yes, within seven days of that happening there, I had a, a sighting with 47 UFOs in the middle of the day. So take that for what you will um, and answer, kind of answer your own question with that. So. With that being said, that was the last question here, Jeff. So I definitely want to thank you for coming and yeah. staying a little longer to answer those. And uh, if you would, can you let everybody know where they can find you, where they can get the book and, and what you're up to? Yeah, you got it. Um, uh, Jeff Selver, www.jeffselver, so J-E-F-F-S-E-L-V-E-R. 
uh, actually as a, as my name is printed right here in the, on the cover here. Um, yeah. So .com, you can find my website at the bottom are my links of that page or the bottom of my, are my YouTube, my Facebook page. Uh, so please, you know, subscribe and, and, uh, connect. I have a lot of content that comes out. Um, I do a lot of presentations and I put a lot of things online and I keep the conversation going and I, yeah, there's, uh, the aliens, the entities, they gave me quite a bit to, to work with. And, uh, so I put a lot of things online and I keep the conversation going. So, yeah. And I'll, let me last minute throw this in. Our, our uh, viewer, Derek Galloway asked this question, just asking, uh, do you think that we are ruled by negative aliens and maybe to go a little further with that do you because i know you're you've explained your experience but do you feel like there's negative aliens out there in addition to the ones that you've interacted with so i have a hard problem a hard time rectifying something here when i hear about malevolent aliens the aliens i am i'm aware of the grays at least these ones these these ones i'm interact i was interacting with um they feel that humans kind of messed up that we messed up the opportunity to to help and rectify things with our planet and though they're interacting with us and they do seem to be uh, quite you know i would say benevol benevolent in, in many cases i'm not i'm not going to put people's abduction cases that are hard and traumatizing into any pocket because i definitely know that that can happen but when we hear about malevolent aliens i'm not clear that we're not talking about an alien species that thinks you know maybe they are thinking of humans as idiots, not dark aliens who are just, who love to feed off of souls and eat humans or something, right? I think that's where that kind of goes. But like, what about the reality that maybe humans, an alien species is overlooking and saying, oh my God, why can't they get their act together? Right? Like that kind of thing. Like they're sitting there staring at us and being like, these guys are idiots. They can't get their acting. They can't clean up their planet. They're, they arm their population. They want constantly want to be at war. Why don't they figure themselves out? And they have a species that maybe acts like that and thinks like that. Um, is that malevolent? You know, is that, is it? I don't know. And I, and because the aliens, these ones, the migraines have a frame of reference where they think that way. They're not, and when I talk like this, I need to always clarify, this doesn't mean they think that way about you, right? Like we're still dealing with, they, they might be thinking about the leadership that way or the collective, but not the individual because seems like in a lot of the contact events they recognize the potential of the human so i think that 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 plays into this now i don't i just don't know that i believe in negative and dark aliens because i don't believe in negative and dark anything i don't even think a human is negative and dark i think a human can get twisted up caught in their society caught in their world and act and act in a way that doesn't benefit them or humanity yes of course and violence can ensue same with animals though but it is a wolf and dark and evil creature because it you know, tears apart a baby deer, right? Is a shark, you know, a dark and evil demon creature because it eats the head of a human as it's gobbling up, you know, what it's, it's, it's meal. Um, right. These are, this nature at play. And I'm not clear yeah. that we actually have negative and dark aliens. I don't quite know that that's true. Um, I don't know that there's evidence for it. And, um, but there is another twist that the human is in a state where we might be doing something that could, make other aliens think like what's wrong with these people uh and i think i know that that plays a part in this so that's that's kind of what i want to say about that yeah awesome awesome and actually on my channel have a show that i did uh titled what's the alien perception of humanity and it goes over exactly what you just talked about is they they could be looking at leadership and but it doesn't and the question was does the their view of our leadership reflect on us as humanity and there's questions there on if they understand that this is their leadership but humanity is a, a, a totally different and i think uh, i forgot it may have been susie that i talked to about that and uh and and yeah i mean that that could be open to perception we don't really know until we were able to sit down and have that conversation with them yeah. but i do appreciate you coming in tonight yeah. jeff uh no we we definitely have to do this again um i think we can we can maybe even talk about that the alien perception of humanity but yeah. let's stay in touch and we can go ahead and set up a date you got it rob that was great yeah you got it buddy all right. Well, thanks so much, Jeff, for coming yeah. in. You have a great rest of your night, and I'll be yeah. talking to you soon. You got it, buddy. Thanks for having me. I love it. Yes, thanks sir. so much. Take care. Yeah, you too. Thanks. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, awesome, awesome show. Jeff Selver came on in talking about his experiences. And, you know, like I said, the whole point of this is and when whenever we sit down and have the conversations is to absorb the information in and, and what Jeff stated tonight may ring with someone out here uh, on their own personal experience. Made me feel like, you know what? I experienced those same things. Or I experienced a couple of those things that he said. So regardless on, on uh, you know, what you walk away with, the data is there for you to refer back to. And I think that's the key, right? Even with my sighting, my sighting doesn't, uh, doesn't solidify anything in the big picture of it all. We can't answer all the questions based on my uh, sightings uh, that I bring to the table or even uh, one's experiences that other people have out there. But I think the goal is to be able to sit down, have these conversations, put all this stuff on the board and be able to refer back to it when maybe you have a sighting tomorrow or tonight or next week or next month that maybe lines up with something that I've said or maybe lines up with something that Jeff or, or many of our other guests that we have here on Spaced Out Radio and uh, more specifically Spaced Out Radio After Hours. Um, and I think just being able to do this and have this conversation is what helps move the needle. That's all this is about, period. It's not about, you know, putting someone on a pedestal or glorifying one sighting over the other. It's about taking in all this information, seeing how this stuff fits into the puzzle so that when we walk away from this as a group, as humanity, we just have a better understanding of what it is that we're dealing with. And you guys know the government will not help with this. So that's why I hate sitting up uh, just talking about the government's perspective or what does the government think about? Why won't the government tell us any of that? I think all that is the distraction in where we're trying to go. It will never be a part of what gets us there. So it's really a waste of time. I feel like sitting up talking about and, and uh, spinning our wheels on the government aspect and, and, and why they won't tell us and just silly stuff like that. Right. I think if you get locked into that part of it, then you'll be spinning the, your wheels for decades to come. Maybe the rest of your life, if you lean on waiting for the government to give you the answers. I think you're going to be waiting for a very, very long time, if not for eternity. So let's take each other's stories, put them up on the board. This is our data that we can parse through and refer back to whenever other people have sightings or experiences. So with that being said, definitely a great show tonight. Uh, definitely appreciate our guests coming through. Uh, we have about 15 minutes here so we're just gonna go ahead and run some uh 15 minutes worth of spaced out radio trivia um go ahead and get your fingers ready i'm i'm gonna go ahead and get something set up here and um and that's how we'll end saturday nights that is how we'll end saturday nights you know what let me do this let me run. I'm going to run a commercial real quick for our uh, Reno trip here. So let me do that first, and then we'll finish 10 minutes out with trivia. So we have, uh, we do not have ugly swag. Dave Scott has already told you about this. Um, we're going to go ahead and take a look at those commercials and the Reno trip, which is now just a little over a month away. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look at that. And here we go. Guess what? We do not have ugly swag. We have spaced out radio gear that you're going to want to wear. Why? Because no one wants to wear ugly clothing. So head on over to spacedoutradio.com and go shopping today. You'll be glad you did. And it's a great way to support our show. Once you get your gear, send us a picture of you rocking out in your SOR swag. Spacedoutradio.com. Shop there today. And make yourself look good you love your woo it's time to make a commitment to the third annual SOR fan party this time 
we're heading to Reno, Nevada and the Silver Legacy Casino and Resort May 10th through 12th, 2024. Tickets are $60 or $100 for VIP. With that, you get a free radio show. You get to hang out with celebrity guests from Spaced Out Radio, including our team, who are coming to hang out with you. You get to meet the entire team, like Science Bob, Merle, Melinda Leslie, Geraldina Roscoe, and more. It's a weekend packed with adventure, and we want you there. After all, we're doing this for you. Find out more and get your tickets at info at spacedoutradio.com and book your hotels today at the Silver Legacy Casino and Resort in Reno, Nevada. Come join us for the SOR Fan Party, May 10th through 12th, 2024. All right, all right, all right. Make sure you're there, guys. If you can be there, make sure you're there. Magneticus brings out a point that there's only 66 likes on this video. Come on, guys. We could do a little bit better than that. Let's try to get it to 100 by the end of the show. If you haven't hit like, go in and consider doing that. If you're watching from the background and you haven't subscribed to the channel, consider doing that. We do the seven days a week right here at Space Style Radio. You get me on Saturday and Sundays, 8 p.m. Pacific to 11 Pacific. Uh, you get Jessica Jones on Sunday right before the After Hours show from 7 p.m. Pacific until 8. And then you have Dave Scott running the route train from Monday through Friday, 9 p.m. Pacific until midnight. So seven days a week, you got something great happening here at Spaced Out Radio. Please consider showing your love and hitting those like buttons and getting us up. Come on, let's, let's, let's raise the bar here. Let's get it up. So with that being said, we got about 13 minutes here. That's enough time to run a little bit of trivia here uh, and go ahead and close the night out here. So let's get this going. Let me go ahead and uh, get this set up. Get your fingers ready. I already have the YouTube chat set up as well. So we're going to be as accurate as we can on this. And I'm going to go ahead and jump in with question number one. Some of these you may have heard before because there's only so many questions that you can answer out there. So question number one, I'm going to go ahead and start right here in the middle uh, with a cryptid question. All right. So what humanoid creature with the ability to shape shift is a prominent figure in Native American folklore? What humanoid creature with the ability to shape shift is a prominent figure in Native American folklore? All right, all right. I think we got one here. Looks like it's Van Gogh coming in with the Skinwalker. Van Gogh is out to a quick early start here. Congratulations, Van Gogh. Let's go to question number two. Number two is a cryptid question again. Okay, so we'll go with in Scottish folklore, what mythical water creature is known for its melodious singing and luring sailors? to their demise in Scottish folklore what mythical water creature is known for its melo melodious singing and luring sailors to their demise see if anybody gets this one here ah we got one hold on let's, let's go back here puck elf Puck Elf uh, gave us the right one here. Let's go back. Puck Elf is on point. It's Kelpie. Awesome, Puck Elf. Awesome. All right. Next question. Uh, okay. Paranormal question. What famous paranormal investigator duo gained popularity for their work and cases inspiring books and movies? What famous paranormal investigator duo gained popularity for their work and cases inspiring books and movies? There are many, many movies. Okay, I think I see it here. It is... Uh, let me see who answered that first. Okay, looks like it's Deb from Psych. It is the Warrens. It is the Warrens. Uh, here we go. Deb from Psych, the Warrens. 
Good job. Uh, let's go. Next question. What this is paranormal. What paranormal phenomenon involves objects moving or being displaced without any apparent physical cause? What paranormal phenomena involves objects moving or being displaced without any apparent physical cause? Yep. Lex Diaz is on point. It is telekinesis. Oh, let me make sure I get that here. Lex Diaz, telekinesis. So the answer is telekinesis or psychokinesis, either one. So good job. All right, next one is. Uh, let's see, okay, UFOs. What famous event in 1967 involved witnesses reporting a UFO encounter in the small town of Shag Harbor in Nova Scotia, Canada? What famous event in 1967 Involved witnesses reporting a UFO encounter in the small town of Shag Harbor in Nova Scotia, Canada. I pretty much said the name of it. All right, there we go. Shag Harbor is the Shag Harbor incident. And uh, yes, it looks like Tamont Man. Got that. It is the Shag Harbor incident. All right. Um, what type? This is a space question. What type of celestial object is a remnant of a massive star that has exhausted its nuclear fuel and undergone gravitational collapse? What type of celestial object is a remnant of a massive star that has exhausted its nuclear fuel and undergone gravitational collapse? Okay, looks like Lex Diaz is on point with that. That's going to be a black hole. Great job, Lex Diaz. All right, next question. UFO question. Which South American country... No, okay. Which country is home to the famous Zone of Silence? Known for a reported UFO sighting and strange magnetic phenomena. Which country is home to the famous, quote, zone of si silence? Known for reported UFO sightings and strange magnetic phenomena. All right. Lex Diaz. That is going to be Mexico. Great job, Lex Diaz. Right, let's go. Let's uh, well, let's get a few more in here. Uh, space question: What is the name of the spacecraft that successfully landed the first humans on the moon in 1969? What is the name of the spacecraft that successfully landed the first humans on the moon in 1969? If you believe that really happened. All right. We got Hank Van Cranenberg. That would be Apollo 11. Not just Apollo. There were like six, 15 some odd Apollos. So Hank got that one right. It's Apollo 11 to be exact. Great job. All right. Next question. Cryptid question. What mythical creature often depicted as a horse with wings is a symbol of inspiration in various mythologies. What mythical creature, often depicted as a horse with wings, is a symbol of inspiration in various mythologies? Oh, okay, Van Gogh came through with Pegasus. It is definitely Pegasus. Let's make sure we uh, give Van Gogh props for that. It's a great job, Van Gogh. Make sure that we start that. Okay, definitely. Pegasus is the correct answer. Uh, okay, paranormal question. What is the term for the alleged ability to communicate with the dead through a medium or spiritual channel? What is the term for the alleged ability 
to communicate with the dead through a medium or spiritual channel. Ah, I see the correct answer here. Aloha Dave came through with mediumship. It is mediumship. Good job, Aloha Dave. And let's go. What else do we have here? Paranormal question. What phenomenon involves a person's consciousness leaving their body and traveling outside, often able to observe their physical self? What phenomenon involves a person's consciousness leaving their body and traveling outside, often able to observe their physical self? All right. Looks like Earth Turtle. It is astral pro oh, astral projection. Now let me make sure. That, that was the first one on YouTube side. No, actually it, w it wasn't. Sorry, Earth Turtle. It looks like, uh, let me go back on the list. Looks like the first person to say it was actually Lex Diaz. So Lex Diaz gets that one, Astral Projection. All right, let's do two more. Uh, let's see. Make sure this is one that is... Okay, in 1980s, a UFO question. 1980, a series of reported UFO sightings and encounters took place in a forest near which Royal Air Force Base in England? In 1980, a series of reported UFO sightings and encounters took place in a forest near which Royal Air Force Base in England? Nope. Okay, I do see somebody here. Who is this? This is uh, Sal Manuel. It's RAF Bentwaters, guys. Everybody thinks Rendlesham. It's RAF Bentwaters. Good job, Sal Manuel. And let's see. Let's fit two more in. We can. We may finish a minute or two over, but let's just do that. Um. Okay, this is a space question. Should be very easy. What is the name of the closest galaxy to the Milky Way? What is the name of the closest galaxy to the Milky Way? Closest galaxy to the Milky Way is... It's like Tomat Man. I know that was a typo, Tomat Man. It's Andromeda. So we'll give that one to you. Good job, Smart Man. All right. Uh, let's see. A cryptic question. What legendary sea monster is said to inhabit the waters of Scotland's Loch Ness? What legendary sea monster is said to inhabit the waters of Scotland's Loch Ness? All right, looks like it's Christine with Nessie. Nessie, Nessie or Loch Ness Monster would have been uh, correct. So good job, Christine. And let's do two more, two more. Okay, um, okay. UFO question, which government department in the United States conducted investigations into UFO sightings from 1952 to 1969? What was the name of the program? Which government department program in the United States conducted investigations into UFO sightings from 1952 to 1969? Uh, 
I'll go. We'll give that to Puck Elf. Puck Elf said Blue Book. We'll accept Blue Book. Uh, where where is that at here? Puck Elf Blue Book. We'll take that. All right. Let's do the last one here. All right. Space question. What is the name of the first? Okay. As far as we know of. What is the name of the first artificial satellite launched into Earth's orbit? As far as we know, what is the name of the first artificial satellite launched into Earth's orbit? All right, we'll go with Hank on this one. I'm not going to let a typo get in the way here. All right, it's going to be Sputnik. So we'll go ahead and end it like that. Great job, everyone. Like I said, regardless who wins tonight, everyone's a winner because you win with knowledge. You walk away from this thing with knowing something you didn't know before. Next time we do trivia, you'll be on point. So let's see who got what. Uh, we got Van Gold with one. One, two. All right, so Van Gogh with two. We got Puck Elf with one, two. All right, we got uh, Deb from Sack with one. We got Lex Diaz. With one, two, three, four. We got Samothman with one. Uh, we got Hank with one, two. All right, we got Aloha Dave with one. We got Salman Well with one. Uh, Christine with one. So our winner for tonight and repeat winner. I don't know if it was last week or a few weeks before, but it's Lex Diaz, ladies and gentlemen. Give it up for Lex Diaz. Congratulations on taking that home tonight. Uh, with that being said, give Lex Diaz a round of applause. I'll give him the horn. Congratulations, Lex Diaz, on winning trivia for tonight. We'll do this again. We always do this. You guys know how this goes. But with that being said, I do want to thank uh, our super chatter from the night, which is Deb from Sacramento showing the love. And also, to everyone else out there, you're already a space traveler. Consider joining the club. Take that next step. Join our Patreon, the SOR Space Travelers Club, for as little as $5 per month. Please consider doing that. Also, please consider being out in Reno for the uh, upcoming fan party. And with that being said, we appreciate everyone's support tonight. Thanks to our guest, Jeff Selver, and everybody who came in and, and kicked it and hung out with us tonight. We appreciate your support to all of our viewers and listeners all across the globe, thanks for tuning your frequency again, once again, to, sp to Spaced Out Radio After Hours, where we do what we do best. And what is that, you ask? Guys, we own the night always, right? Please be back tomorrow as we have our guest, Tress Blair, coming on in, and we're going to get into some more woo. So until then, you guys have a great rest of your night. Tomorrow night, we'll do the uh, call-in show, so make sure you guys are ready for that as well. I'll get everything posted tonight. Outside of that, you guys have a great rest of your night. Take care.